from the meeting at this point in our reorganization meeting we are going to elect a chair and at this point i will take nominations for chair um i would like to nominate michelle bailey for the chair second Any other yeah. nominations? Any discussion? Uh, I just want to say that I actually think that Michelle is the perfect person for the role moving into the transition of a new superintendent. Uh, she's also always uh, obviously very thorough um, and has a really good understanding of our district and our town. So uh, this makes a lot of sense. And um, Michelle, if you need any help anywhere along the way, please call somebody else. I'm, I'm <laughs> no, but uh, I, I'd be the first to vote aye if she accepts. I would accept. Um, so I make a motion that the Hamilton Wenham School Committee accepts um, the nomination and acceptance of Michelle Bailey as the 2020-2021 School Committee Chairperson. Second. By Peter Walzik. Roll we'll call vote. Right. Dana? Yes. Anna? Yes. Michelle Horgan? Yes. Michelle Bailey. Yes. Peter Wal Walchick. Did I get it right, Wal Peter? Wal Walzik. Walzik, I'm still working on it. Just like seed zick, Walzik. <laughs> it's going to be a quiz at the end of the meeting, right? There's it's a, a big yes. <laughs> and David Plito. Yes. So congratulations, Michelle. Congrats, Michelle. Thanks, Dave. Michelle, I'll turn it over to you. David, thank you. Yeah, thanks, Dave. Um, so do we want to continue with C or do we want to go back to A? Or did A happen already? Uh, no, I mean, I just said hi when they first came in just so it wouldn't be rude, right. but <laughs> I don't think it was anything official. Come on, give me a hug. <laughs> okay. So, um, all right, so let's finish C. Um, we need to elect a vice chair, a secretary, and an assistant secretary, and then Another position that the school committee appoints is the treasurer. So we'll um, appoint a treasurer and an assistant treasurer, but those are actually employees. So their names are here. So um, is there a nomination for vice chair? I'd actually like to nominate Michelle Horgan for vice chair. I second that. M Michelle, do you accept? Sure. Thank you. <laughs> It'll make it easy for Thank the. You. Chair and the vice chair, Michelle. Michelle. Oh, easy. Just Michelle can sign everything. Um, <laughs> thank you. Um, I don't know if I can make a motion. Can I? I guess I can. Right. I make a motion that the Hamilton Wenham School Committee um, nominates and accepts Michelle Horgan's um, acceptance of vice chair for the 2020-2021 school year. Second. Uh, roll call. Roll call vote. Um, Dana. You're muted. Yes. Dana has it. Dana has it. Yes. Uh, Michelle Horrigan. Yes. Michelle Bailey, yes. Anna Cizik. Yes. David Polito. Mm, that yes. Good. And Peter Wolzik. Yes. Great. Then um, we need to elect a secretary. Um, the secretary's responsibilities are basically to get the minutes from Mahala, proofread them, um, you know, fill in any gaps, and also be Mahala's go-to person should she have a question about how to spell a resident's name or something of that nature. Um, do we have any nominations for secretary? Um, I'd like to nominate Dana Lara. Dana, do you accept? Yes, a little bit nervous about that, but yes. <laughs> so I, I just want to interject that we tend to try and persuade new members to take on the secretary and vice secretary roles because it's a really um, good sort of catch up to, to learn the procedures. So it's like it, you have to sort of learn them. So right. it's, 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 it's a, and you have plenty of help. All right. 
and I will just say that this is Dana, this is our fourth relationship together in one fashion or another. So I can, what, I, what I've learned and mistakes I've made the last two months, I can help you out with. Okay. All right. So we have um, a motion, a second, and an acceptance. So we'll vote on that. Um, Who seconded it? Did somebody actually say I don't it? think I made a motion yet. Oh, I thought you did. No. Great. Oh, you um, made, made the nomination and the acceptance. Great. Make a motion. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Um, I make a motion that the Hamilton Women School Committee um, accepts the nomination um, and acceptance of Dana Lara as secretary for the 2020-2021 school year for the Hamilton Women School Committee. I'll second that. Dana, uh, Michelle. A roll call. Anna, second. Um, first vote alphabetically, Dana. <laughs> yes. Um, Michelle Bailey, yes. Michelle Horrigan. Yes. David Polito? Yes. Anna Cizik? Yes. Peter Waldick? Yes. Okay. Yeah, that, um, assistant Secretary. So that person would basically fill in at the Secretary for whatever reason wasn't at a meeting, so didn't feel comfortable proofreading. Also, um, you know, if for whatever reason the Secretary wasn't here, Mahal wasn't here, we were having an executive session, might take the minutes. Um, do we have a nomination for assistant secretary? Um, I'll nominate uh, Anna uh, Cizik. Anna, do you accept? I do accept. All right. Um, Are there any other nominations? Oh, sorry. Just checking. Any discussion? Oops. No, make a motion. All right, I make a motion that the Hamilton Women's School Committee accepts the nomination of Anna Cizik and her acceptance for the 2020-2021 school year as Assistant Secretary for the Hamilton Women's uh, Regional School Committee. Great, is there a second? Second. I second. Okay, second by Peter, he's one oh, second faster. That's All right. <laughs> <laughs> by roll call, Dana. Yes. Um, Michelle Bailey, yes. Michelle Horgan. Yes. David Polito. Yes. Anna Cizik. Yes. Peter Walzik. Yes. Great, super, so that's done. Um, and then we need to appoint a district treasurer and an assistant treasurer. Um, Vinny, when in warrants again? Uh, they just happened today. The next ones are the Great. Right. So we can do that next week. Great. The, the so, 15th. Yeah. So the treasurer is, has for a very long time been John Gallant, and we have recently had this assistant treasurer who fills in for when um, Don goes on vacation or happens to be ill for some reason. Um, so I guess we need a motion to appoint Don Gallant as treasurer and Kevin Mahoney as assistant treasurer. I'll make the motion if that's okay, Dana. Um, I make a motion that the Hamilton Women's School Committee um, accepts, excuse me, appoints um, the district treasurer, Don Gallant, um, as treasurer and Kevin Mahoney as the assistant treasurer for the 2020-2021 school year. And do we have okay. a second by Mr. Walzik? Um, any discussion about that? Do we, I, it has nothing to do, I guess, with the treasurer. Do we have to also create a new list of who signs warrants? Yeah, and we'll have to do that next week because the warrants will be needing to be signed on the 15th, yeah. Good, good call, Peter. Um, okay, so uh, we have a motion and a second. Um, we'll vote by roll call. Uh, Dana? Yes. Michelle Bailey? Yes. Michelle Horrigan? Yes. David Polito? Yes. Anna Cedic? Yes. Peter Walzik? Yes. Great. So we're done with that. Um, so did we have a recognition of Ty before we went to executive? Not yet. Yeah. And like I said, I didn't, uh, okay. I, I literally just said hi to everybody. <laughs> I, okay. It was, All right. So let's, so um, there was an election, the town of Wenham and the town of Hamilton held an election because of that election. We have um, new members um, with the, oh, did we not get a summary of the totals? We only. Yeah, we have it. We have. This is only one of in the thing. I sent over the whole summary for Janelle to put in. Oh, I thought those were the combined numbers. No, they're not. Um, 
Well, I can look it up real quick. Combine, the combined numbers I sent over in an email to Janelle to put in as an exhibit, but I didn't check that she did it. It's too bad Ty's not on here so we can see. Thank you. Right, we'll send him a letter. Okay, so the final results are that. Dun, 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 come on. It's great when I could see the picture. Um, um, Mrs. Cizik received 1,324 votes. Mrs. Alara received 1,275 votes. And Mr. Prijma received 581 votes. Um, therefore, Ms. Alara and Ms. Cizik are um, the new members of the committee. Um, and so we want to thank Ty because quite frankly, he came in in the middle of the year, which is difficult. And he went ahead and agreed to run again, which was very important to us. And it was very valuable to have his insight um, as a social worker throughout, especially, um, you know, to be able to understand some of the emotions that sometimes happen um, through these discussions. So we will send him a thank you letter. Yeah, he really had the student social emotional needs in the, in the forefront. Yeah. And All right. So that was important. great. Um, now I gotta go back, get this back open. Sorry. Okay. And then, okay. So now we need to do a policy and negotiation subcommittee. And then at our next meeting, we can do um, a warrants, talk about who's gonna be on finance. And then if we have um, other needs for different working groups this year based on you know, the situations what, that we're in. Um, so currently the policy working group has been Peter and myself. Um, it's a little dicey only having two people on a working group because if one of you doesn't show up, you can't have the meeting or one of you sick or whatever, um, or has a car accident or whatever. But so we have had a great help with Dorothy Presser going through the policy <laughs> where cranking through, but we have some really big ones to go through this year. Um, so we need people who can meet at least monthly with Dorothy. Um, and read through those policies it probably takes, I mean, the, the meetings are about two hours um, and ahead of time, if you're reading ahead of time, another maybe hour or so. Um, I mean, I'm enjoying, being, I'm, enjoy, I'm learning a lot being on policy and I'd like to continue. Okay. And if possible, I'd like to also be on negotiations, but we'll see. Okay. Um, I would be interested in serving on policy. I think that would be a good match for some of my skills and interests. And I think it would also help me learn uh, some of the you know, history and backbone of the district. So I would volunteer to serve on policy. Yeah, I've, I've been learning a tremendous amount from Michelle, <laughs> Michelle Bailey. She has a, a tremendous amount of institutional knowledge and between, you know, the regional agreement and what's under the regional agreement, what's in policy and how it used to be and how it should be. So I've, I've learned a lot, Anna, from working with Michelle. Is there anyone else who's interested in being on policy? Uh, I, I guess I'm interested, but I'm sort of intrigued by negotiations. So, so if that, okay. That. Yeah. All right. So let's start. Um, can we? Again, the let's, question is if you want to be on policy or you just. So, well, yeah, right. <laughs> so, all right. So, okay. So we have that. So let's go to discussion. So, negotiations this year. This summer is going to be a little intense because you're going to have to negotiate some new working terms, probably, um, related to the reopening of school. And then right off of that, we have three contracts that will need to be negotiated, and you will be um, having our town partner from Hamilton for the next three years. Um, so it'll be a group of three. Mary Beth will be included. Um, we'll probably have Naomi doing some work for us, our legal counsel. 
Um, and, you know, Mary Beth and Vinnie will be in to advise and that happens with each union. And, um, and who's already the, um, who is already the negotiations? Currently it's Michelle Horgan, David and myself. So do you have, so is that, I guess I'm trying to be, you know, as helpful to the group as possible. So if you've already got three and you don't need, you know, then I'm. <laughs> Excuse me. I, I'd like to, well, just to hop in, because I think it'll help this conversation. I definitely want to stay on the negotiations committee, or I'd like to rather. Um, and I am toying with um, the policy committee. But um, as I told some of the um, members of the board that, you know, I really want to sort of try and spend a little bit more time with my kids. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm trying not to overextend myself uh, this year. So um, like if that board did fill up, um, I'm fine with it. But if it needed someone else, then I would join policy as well. But um, I've been on negotiations for two years now and um, would just like to keep moving forward, especially with all the contracts and stuff coming up. I already know where we've been and um, can, go, can go running with it. <clears throat> Excuse uh -huh. me. Michelle Horgan, I know you had expressed some interest in maybe not doing negotiations this year. Is that still your feeling? Um, I, I think it's what's best for the board. I, I feel I'm torn because I do have a lot of relationships with the teachers, which is a double-edged sword at times. So I don't know if, um, and I will put it out to you, Michelle and David, since you have been in meetings, you know, is it helpful or is it, a, a, is it hindering? Um, so uh, I could definitely say a bit of calming presence in my life. So. Uh -huh. No, you so, have but, um, but I don't know, Michelle, you made a point at our last meeting that potentially we need someone new that's going to be, um, you know, has some history. So for the next negotiations, you right. know, moving right, forward. Right, right. Yeah, I, I did say that. Like it, 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 <laughs> it, it'd be a shame uh -huh. for there not to be someone who's had experience the next time we negotiate. So, um, I mean, can I suggest, Dana, since you're interested, it's my observation that you are new, so you're trained, you know, trained, but you don't, you know, currently have kids in the district and that emotional sort of conflict that Michelle Horgan might feel from time to time, or frankly, I might feel from time to time and would have a hard time with also. Um, yeah, no, I, I mean, I, I, would, yeah, I mean, I, again, I, you know, it's, you know, something that I, I would be interested in helping out with the negotiation. Um, if that if it feels like a good fit to the to the group yeah i'm i'm fine i'm fine stepping back and letting dana come on if you guys think that's the best then that's good yeah um do you want to come do policy with us what i can't hear you i'm what what yeah that's not so, what we can let, all right so um peter tell us about your interest in being on negotiations i'm sorry Tell us about your interest in being on negotiations. Well, I think I think we're we're in extremely tight budget concerns, and that this is going to last over the next several years. Um, I think we need to probably be less generous with our contracts. We also need to be clearer in the language. There's some language in there that's uh, it's just too vague and open to abuse or misinterpretation. Um, yeah, and it, you know, again, I, I was a teacher in the district for four years. I know teachers are underpaid, um, but I also understand the unique budgetary needs of this district. And I've watched my taxes double since we moved here in 2009. And so I think um, through negotiations is another avenue where we can, you know, try to control, you know, control our budget further because 87 to 89 percent of our budget cannot be touched. It's either contractual, legal, uh, mandated, and the only part of the budget we, the most of the, the, the most effective part of the budget or the part we can control the most is through negotiations, through salary. And we need just to be a little bit tighter with our finances. Mary Beth, can I ask you a question? So you're muted, just so you know ahead of time. So um, is it typical for the chair to be on negotiations in your experience, or is it typical for that not to be the case? Um, I haven't found that to be either typical or atypical. 
Yeah. I think yeah. It's something that, that is up to the committee to decide. Yeah. I would be. I think Michelle, you have, you have the value of being a teacher and also being on the school committee. It puts you in a I very. I also feel that conflicting a little bit because I have, you know, Hamilton uh, Wenham does well in their contracts, then my union would use that same <laughs> thing. On the other hand, you know. But, but you, you can talk the language with the teachers too. And they understand. And, they, and what I have seen the last three months is that they do value what you say um, and they respect what you say. So I think your value on this subcommittee is huge. It's, it's beyond. Um, I, I personally like the idea that our, because our board is a mix of actual teacher teachers and then people who are knowledgeable or have prior things. I mean, I think, um, I don't know how many, do we have to have three or four? Is there a maximum or minimum number? If you have four, it gets weird. Um, All right, because you're plus so three or five, which five no, would be has two. They, they have two. Um, but then they have a situation where, you know, Naomi always comes and the superintendent always comes and the assistant superintendent always comes. So it's. Um, <clears throat> I know two yeah. years ago when I first became chair, you suggested that it was best that I actually be on the negotiations board as yeah, chair. That's you. <laughs> I'm just, you know, um, and <clears throat> I don't know. I, 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 I'm sort of, I'm with Michelle Horgan. Like, you also know where we're coming from. Um, you, you, you know the backstory, what we're, what we're going into, um, the stuff that's coming up sort of next week, and the stuff that'll be coming up in like two months. You already have yeah. the backstory. But also the workload, though, on um, Michelle, too. I mean, yeah. are you still thinking? Oh, about trust me, I understand the workload. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I also you, am a little concerned about that because I think we are going into such a difficult process. And we've already hinted at and talked about um, other subcommittees potentially creating or resurrecting other groups. I mean, I, I, there's only seven of us, and I don't want anyone to feel spread too thin. But I also think it's important to get the right board members utilizing their best skills to best help the district, so. So I would make a proposal that I would be willing for consistency sake to get us through to the fall, but I am not sure I can negotiate a contract this year. I'm not sure that I can do that. Well, that's okay, because uh, no. I'm trying not try to say what I want to say without, well, we've had some ideas about possibly bringing help on the contracts that yeah. we had discussed okay. before. So, um, okay. So there's four people who are interested. Um, we really should get down to three, so it's not a quorum. Um, could, could, excuse me, could we um, have the person that doesn't get on be the uh, replacement for you in the fall? Oh, that would definitely be the case, yeah. So could we vote in? I don't think we could vote in four with one starting in September. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, also, what happens? Right, let's, let's see. What happens, can I ask what happens to Stacy in these meetings? Does she? Yeah. Um, so last year, Stacy was on um, exactly. finance, and I'm assuming she'll want to continue in that role because that also covers um, other topics that are of interest to her. And she's also pretty good with the spreadsheet. So, um, so can we vote in Peter and David and you now with the idea that in the fall, we might take another vote and have Dana replace you? I would, I would suggest in, in, um, that Dana come on now so she can learn from Michelle and David and then Peter, who has all, you have institutional knowledge, Peter being on the school committee for so many years, that he replaced Michelle. Just a suggestion. Yeah. Um, yeah, let's, it, Peter, if that's okay with you, would that be fine just to get the, get some consistency through the summer to get the work conditions? And then as soon as that's done, I would be happy to resign well, from negotiation. Well, we have, we have consistency with you and David, right? Oh, I see what you're saying. Okay, so between you and Dana. Yeah, I see what you're saying. 
All right, so let's do that. Let's, um, let's see. So do we wanna have, so both Dana and Peter are interested as are David and myself. Um, so let's just have the four of us give a spiel about why we would be the best person to be on the negotiations working group. And then we'll um, do a vote, maybe I'm trying to think of how to do that best. Um, Well, let's do the spiel and then we'll figure out what we're going to do from there. So <laughs> we're going alphabetical order. Dana, give us a spiel. Okay. Well, I do, I, I think that I know I have a ton to learn in order to be on the negotiations group. So I do think a big part of the reason I'd like to be on it is so that I can get up to speed quickly um, to be a really helpful member of this group. Um, just in terms of no negotiations, I do feel like, as we discussed earlier, I'm in a good position. I do have relationships with some teachers, um, mostly though they are of a different nature than a lot of other people here. I've known teachers mainly through um, working with them through the Ed Fund, um, which is a little bit different. Um, my kids did go to school here, but it's been a while and they're not in schools anymore. Um, and uh, yeah, so I, I mean, I'm, I know there's a ton to learn from you guys and I would love to jump in. <laughs> Super. So. Obviously, I just want to be on the committee to get us through the summer because I feel like there's a, a need for some trust and consistency. It's going to be really hard. Um, we're going to be asking teachers to do a lot, and we're going to be asking our custodians to do a lot, and um, you know the nurses and everybody. So we're going to need to make sure that um, you know they trust us and we trust them. And I think we do have some trust going on right now. So. Um, I would definitely like to continue for that reason. Um, I also do feel like I have a pretty good handle on what's been in several contracts recently. And, um, you know, when I discuss that with some of the union leaders, it's interesting that we agree on exactly what happened in the past. So it's been pretty good. So um, I think I bring that to the table. All right, uh, next alphabetically, David Polito. Um, so I've been on the negotiations board for subcommittee for two years now. <clears throat> Excuse me, I helped um, negotiate the current custodial contract. Um, I've also been involved in obviously the talks about uh, with the teachers union this past fall as we try and um, make some changes to pivot around COVID. Um, you know, prior to that, I was a manager of a union shop for. 10 years. So I actually know my way around the, the language pretty well. All right. And uh, Peter, that Walsic makes you last. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, well, I, I was a teacher in the district for four years and there is a tremendous amount of trust in me because the teachers know how much I valued them and prioritize them. Uh, to, for student success, um, but I also understand that there are people across the country who have lost everything, and it's not a big ask for to to tighten our budget that we you know lower our cola, lower our you know our our um, the amounts that we put on the table in order to protect the students, protect the, protect the budget. Because there, again, there are people who lost everything, so it's not a big ask to ask people to give up a little bit of future money in order to protect the students and protect more jobs. Um, I also have a, a good relationship with John Koch. I think he trusts me. He knows that I'm, I was a teacher and, um, but also I watch my taxes grow and the, the place where we can affect probably the budget the most is through negotiations with the uh, um, teachers. That's how big, that's, that's where we can affect the budget the most. 87 to 89% of our budget cannot be touched because it's mandated, it's legal, it's fixed costs, it's operations costs, it's utility costs. So where we can affect the budget the most is through negotiations with the teachers union and the other yeah, collective bargaining units. Okay. Now, um, because Michelle Horrigan 
you're the vice president, vice chair, and you are not involved in this. And I ask that you make a motion with three, I guess, and then we'll vote. Or should we do it one at a time? What do you think, Michelle? Um, I say we make a motion to elect three, and then okay. do a roll call and who, right? Great. You'll so you pick the three. And... I, I'll pick the three. Well, this is what I'm asking you. How do you want to do this? Oh, um, I would say a roll call, don't you? Everyone vote their top okay. three. Oh, okay. Let's go through. Okay, let's do that. All right, great. Dana, who would be your top three? Um, I no? Okay. Uh, what was that? Yourself? <laughs> no, I just didn't hear you. Oh, so I'm going to, I guess, yeah, I will vote for myself, Michelle Bailey, and David Polito. Okay. Um, the next person to vote is me. I'm would vote for Michelle Bailey, Dana, um, I'm gonna vote for Peter. Okay, next is uh, Michelle Horgan. I'll vote for Dana, Michelle Bailey, and um, David Polito. Okay, and then David, are you available? I am, I'm right here. <clears throat> um, so David Polito, Dana, Lara, and Michelle Bailey. Anna? I would vote for Dana, Michelle Bailey, and David Polito, but I would like to note that I support the idea of Peter coming on when we're through the rocky bit of the summer. I think that's important to get that on the record because I am concerned about Michelle Bailey, your workload, and I like the idea that we're encouraging our board members to learn new skills. If we only ever go with legacy, no one ever learns anything new. So. I think this is a good blend for now. So I would go Dana, Michelle, Polito for now, and I'd like to see Peter moved on in the fall. And Peter. Uh, myself, Michelle Bailey, David Polito. Okay, so based on that, it would be Dana, Michelle Bailey, and uh, David Polito. So um, why don't we make a motion on that and then we can have some discussion. Um, I make a motion. Are you okay, Dan, with me doing it? Sure. Yes. Okay. I'll make a motion that the Hamilton Women's School Committee accepts the uh, nomination to the negotiation subcommittee of Michelle Bailey, David Polito, and Dana Alara. I'll second that. So I just want to um, just say that the reason I voted the way I did was um, I think it makes sense for Peter to come on in the fall um, just because the negotiations committee will probably be involved in something that um, could be a conflict, could be considered a conflict of interest well, um, well, over the summer. Again, we've gone through this before. I've taken an oath of office and I am not conflicted. My number, my oath of office tells me that I do what's best for the district and it has nothing to do with friendships. Um, and so I'm a little bit upset that, again, people question my integrity. Not questioning your integrity at uh, all, Peter. It's questioning my integrity by saying there's a conflict of interest, but there's no conflict of interest because I took an oath of office. Yeah. I, be a, I lost my job as a special agent because I crossed the blue line and reported corrupt agents. If I'm willing to do that, I'm willing to do what's best for a, a school budget. Yeah. I am actually kind of, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty upset about that. that I'm be, again being accused that I have a conflict of interest when I do the best that's in the interest of the school district and the well, students and the budget. And I, the I apologize if I upset you because that wasn't the intention at all. There's no, nothing I, wrong I with having. Here when the vote happened, I can see there was some behind the scenes discussions. I'm, I'm pretty upset. Here. Okay. My integrity is questioned and I am livid. So, um, all right, we do have a motion and a second, and I do hear um, that there, but we're going to go ahead and vote. Um, Dana, so what, it, what a vote, a yes vote means you are voting to have Dana, Lara, Michelle Bailey, and David Polito be on the negotiations. For yes. Longer. Uh, Michelle Bailey, yes. Uh, oh, sorry, Michelle Horgan. <laughs> yes. <laughs> David Polito. Yes. Uh, Anna Cizik. Yes. And Peter Walzik. No. Okay. 
So that passes. And now, um, all right, so. Excuse me, can I make a motion that um, in September, um, the Peter Wolgic becomes a replacement when you roll off, Michelle? I would normally say yes, but just in the interest of time, can we do that in September? Yep, perfect, yep. Um, the next thing is we didn't fully populate um, policy. I think maybe we should go ahead and have Peter and Anna be on that and then... Um, and, and you, excuse me, and if, if I'm needed, if they need another body, I'd be happy to do that. Well, haven't we established right now it is just the two of us? Yeah, so if Michelle, so we didn't vote on it, right? Yeah, I guess that's fine because if Stacy stays on pop on whatever the finance thing, then there's mm -hmm. at least some consistency with that group. That's mm -hmm. okay, that's fine. Great. So, so, so do we need to vote on the policy group then? I don't yeah. think we have voted on that. Yep, we do. Okay, we do. So, I make a motion that the Hamilton School Committee accepts um, the um, policy group, working group, as Anna Seswick, uh, Peter Wolgic, and sit, sit, we will get through it, and okay. Michelle Horgan. Is there a second to that motion? Second. I, great. Second. Dana. Sorry, Dana I, I was on mute. Um, all right, so roll call vote. Dana. Yes. Sorry, Michelle, quick, Michelle you're not on the policy anymore? That would be correct, because I'm unsure. You can call me if you have a question. Too bad, because I learned a tremendous amount from you. Yeah, and I'm sorry, I thought it was the, the motion was for Michelle Horgan, myself, and Peter on policy. Correct, I am no longer on, correct, yeah. So, but there are a couple of policies that need to be ad addressed that I will be sure and make sure the committee knows about. Um, so we are still doing this. So Michelle Bailey voted yes. Pete, uh, Michelle Horgan. Yes. David Polito. Yes. Anna Cizik. Yes. Peter Walzik. Um, yes. Thank you. Thank you for continuing on that, Peter, because obviously you know what a workload that is. <laughs> so, okay. Um, next, I just would like to respect Mr. Rosario's time, and if it's okay with all of you, I wouldn't. I would like to move um, his request up so that he can present that now. Is there any opposition to that? Okay. All right. So he's going to present this. I'm just going to say up front that I am um, going to abstain from any voting on this because I too am a member of the MTA and this resolution was put out by the MTA. Um, so I believe there would be a conflict in my voting for us to um, support this. So I'm not going to say whether or not I think you should, I'm just gonna say I'm going to abstain. Um, Vinny, would you be able to promote um, Nicholas Restaino? Thank you. Also, Vinny, is it possible in the upper corner, there's um, speaker view and gallery view. Could you click on gallery view? So it, it is under gallery view. I was told if you're watching from TV, it doesn't work that way. Interesting, it okay. Automatically goes to who's talking. Great, all right, Mr. Steino, if you'd like to present the resolution, that would be great. All right, thank you very much for the opportunity uh, for anybody else out there that doesn't know who I am. My name is Nicholas Rostino. Uh, I've taught now for 13 years at the high school. I'm a history teacher, and uh, I'm now the vice president for the Hamilton Wenham uh, Regional Education Association, i.e. The, the teachers union. And I feel that in this trying time, it's, it's really vitally important that we invest in, in education and we call on our uh, elected leaders to, to also invest in, in education. Education is vital for the survival of a democracy. And uh, as the MTA says, now more than ever is, is really the time to invest um, in, in really the future, not only of, of Hamilton and Wenham, but in the future of the United States. Uh, so they have a resolution that I feel it really addresses at its core 
uh, what the federal government, the state government, the local governments need to do in order to adequately fund uh, student education in this very trying time. Now, I don't know if it would be redundant for me to read it, um, but I can, I can read the resolution um, if you would prefer. Uh, does the committee want that read or has you all had a chance to review it? I've, I've read it, um, so I don't personally need it, but out loud. Yeah, I've read it too. Okay. All right, so um, we'll just go with that. People have read it. Um, do people have questions about this? I don't have a question. I, can I make a comment? Sure. Um, I am happy to see this brought before the school. And I think, uh, I think Nicholas, what you said is really important that it's, it's, it is a crucial moment for elected officials to show leadership around policy and funding. And I think if people in our position don't show that leadership, I'm not sure who we're expecting else to do it. So um, I'm really glad that you're here before us. And I like the wording of the resolution. I like the strength of it. And I would be happy to support it. Any other discussion? Right. So I guess we need a motion that would support or, yeah, I guess support because motions are always in the positive. Okay, um, I make a motion that the Hamilton Wyndham School Committee um, supports the resolution brought forth from the MTA and the HWEA um, resolution in support of educating funding in the COVID-19 era. I'll second that. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Is there any more discussion? Just, um, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, we'll recognize Michelle Horgan and then I'll recognize Mr. Wolzik. Just um, interested in, in how many of our cohorts um, or Cape Ann League schools have also presented this to their school committee. Do you have any idea? Um, I do not. Uh, I'm not aware. And I was looking on the MTA's website for a list of, of schools. Um, and it's probably, it's probably there. I just don't, um, I wasn't able to locate that today. Great. Thank you. And Peter? No, I was, what I would say is I'm also a member of the MTA. But I, I am going to vote and, uh, because I do not see a conflict because this is in the best interest of, interest of our students, our teachers and staff, our budgets, and our taxpayers. So I will be voting for this. Okay. There's, no, there's no conflict there for me. Are we good? All right. Um, Dana. Yes. Michelle Bailey abstain. Michelle Horgan. Yes. Uh, David Polito. Yes. Anna Cizik. Yes. Uh, Peter Walzik. Yes. And thank you, Nick. Thank you, Nick. We also have signed a similar, uh, we talked about that. We have a similar resolution we have already uh, signed on to through the MASC also. So. Um, yes, I read that. And thank you. Thank you very much for your consideration and, and for your support for this resolution. Super. Thank you. We look forward to working with you this year. Thank great. you. Bye. Have okay. a great summer. Um, Dorothy Presser, I texted her. Um, so she's here now if we want to start that. Um, you should have received an email from Mary Beth or a forwarded email from me, um, depending on who you are, that has this book. You can, um, if you've pre-printed it out, you can have this here. If you haven't pre-printed it out, then you can um, just look at it digitally because it's been provided. I think it was a Word document, so it's even editable. Um, Michelle, I think we should go on with Dorsey, but I just want to make sure, are we skipping over point E about the liaisons? Yes, we'll come back to that. Okay. Because we're probably going to skip it tonight. Okay. <laughs> All right, Dorothy. Well, okay. Thank you. We wow. have two new members uh, elected since the last time you were here. We have Dana Alara and Anna Cizik. Well, uh, I, and I think I actually had the chance to meet both of you in person, maybe early last March at a school committee meeting that I was at. So it's wow. nice to see you again. Welcome um, to school board membership or school board service. Um, so you all have the workbook tonight and I'm, I'm really happy to be back with all of you. I felt like I was, <laughs> 
knew uh, was there so much in the in the spring through the search. It's kind of nice to see everybody again and kind of be back. Um, hopefully, sometime in the not too distant future, back in person. Um, so. I wanted to start tonight um, with just having people do some introductions. Um, and what I want you to think about as you're doing the introduction is, um, so think about where, we, where you are today as a committee. Um, it's Mary Beth's first day, it's Dana and Anna's first meeting. Um, and you're, so now you're really a new team that's coming together and needs to work together. So if you think about today, and you imagine yourselves a year from now, um, what is your biggest hope of how you would progress as a team, as a governance team throughout the course of the year? Um, I'm gonna start with Michelle Bailey. Um, so where we are now, I think we're one year better than we were a year ago. Um, and I think that where I'd like for us to be in a year from now is there used to be a time when after school committee meetings, the school committee would go out and have a drink or maybe have dinner together um, because they wanted to. And I would hope that at some point we would reach a point where A, we could do that and feel safe and B, that we would want to actually spend time together socially. So, okay. Next, I'm gonna pick on David. Uh, it's funny that, uh, cause I was just gonna hop on and say that I remember we used to try or like talk about doing that, but then the meeting started running too long and the black cloud closes at 10. So, um, but no, I, I actually really like what uh, Michelle said there. Excuse me, I think that this committee made great leaps this past year um, compared to where we were the year prior. Um, and I like to just like to see, you know, continue momentum in the forward direction, working together as a team, um, because we had a lot of stuff to overcome this year, and we just really had to rely on each other to to help guide us through it. So, <clears throat> okay. How about Michelle Horrigan? Um, I'm hopeful. Last year, when I joined, I felt like um, we were putting out fires, and it, um, but as the year got on, uh, moved on rather, uh, progressed, we became more of a team. Um, so I'm hopeful, definitely moving forward, that um, that we'll continue to make progress. Okay. Uh, how about Anna? Do you want to jump on? Sure. Um, I share all those concerns. Um, I think two things that come to my mind are that we are all familiar enough and trained enough uh, in these different aspects of our work that the notion of sort of legacy and transference would be there that if any point any one of us had to step in for the other that we would have some familiarity with the process and the topic so um i just think there's sort of that line between you know being really specialized and knowing every detail but also having enough conversant knowledge that you know even if you're on not on this committee, it's not going to be a huge learning curve to come. So I guess I, I like the idea of shared teaching because I think individually we all have strengths and knowledge, but you know, together the seven of us know a lot about a different thing. So I like the idea of establishing a culture through which we all teach each other and share what we know. Um, I think that will make the board more versatile and more nimble moving forward year to year because there's always going to be people coming and going. So as much as we can maintain um, institutional knowledge amongst each other. That's one goal I think is good. I think the other one is more outward facing. I would like to see our position within the community really be um, well respected as a board that works well together, that's seen as being collegial and professional, knowledgeable, uh, forthright. I think sometimes in the community there's an impression that we are um, you know, not being forthright with information or not sharing information as readily or, you know, not approachable for whatever reason. I would like everyone in our community to see us as valuable, knowledgeable, respectful leaders that are really, really working hard for our town and for our students. So um, I'm not going to say that we have to repair a lot of damage, but I do think there's some damage to the reputation of the school committee. And I think it's okay to acknowledge that and look for ways to build those bridges back up again. 
Dana, do you want to jump in? Sure. Um, I think uh, what Michelle Bailey said right off the bat, I actually think there's tremendous meaning, meaning in being on a board that works weather, well enough together to be able to actually want to um, socialize together. And I, I have been on boards that have challenging, contentious conversations and are still able to do that. And I think that is the sign of a really, truly healthy um, board. And so I think there, that that would be my dream is that we're able to have really meaningful conversations, even in difficult conversations and still have respect and professionalism. Okay. Peter, do you want to bring up the rear for the school committee? And then I'll ask Mary Beth. Yes, thank you, Ms. Presser. Uh, I, I would say we are light years beyond the acrimonious and toxic atmosphere that we used to have when we first joined. I think that had a lot to do with the change of um, administration. And so I am thrilled about that. I think that over the last year, we have really come together as a team and I've been excited to work with everyone. Um, I would like to see our communications be better between the team because it seems like there's a lot discussed um, off the record that not every school committee member knows about without violating any kind of open meeting laws. Um, so there's a lot of communications as demonstrated tonight, behind the scene communications. Um, I'd also like to see us have a, a, a more collaborative relationship with the town selectmen, the town leaderships the FinComs, because it, there does seem to be a lot of us versus them when we are really just one team and we really all have the community's best interest in mind. So uh, those are my, that's on my wish list. Okay, Mary Beth. Um, great, thank you, Dorothy. I think for me, one of the pieces that's really critical is for us to collectively get clear on where we're headed. You know, what are the, what's the vision? You know, what, where are we rowing to? And I think that not, you know, I think about that within the committee and how we um, have a level of coherence as, as we move forward. Um, and then how do we bring that to our community as well so that we're, we're all, all really clear on where it is this district is headed. Well, thanks everyone. Uh, now I'm going to share my screen. Um, host has disabled participant screen sharing. Vinny, can you? <laughs> but yet the host is here. <laughs> oh, it looks like I will be Should be good. good. It should be good, okay. Uh, share. Okay, so what I'm going to do tonight is just very in very broad strokes go over um, what makes an effective school committee and the roles and responsibilities just in very broad terms. Um, most of you who've been on the or all of you who've been on the committee have heard this before and for Dana and Anna you'll be getting it in more depth when you take the charting the course hopefully sometime soon. Um, so I just want to do like a broad review of that. Um, and then jump into some um, discussion about you being a new team and where, where are some of the areas where um, you can have um, community expectations about working with each other. So we know from, from research um, that what makes an effective school committee that has a positive impact on student achievement. Um, and you've probably all remember hearing me say before that when we talk about student achievement, um, we're talking about how you define it for, for, your, um, for your district. Not, it's not just MCAS scores, it's not just standardized test scores. Um, so um, we know through research again that there are certain attributes and practices that are in place when you have an effective school committee that has that high impact on student achievement. Um, the first is that they have a vision of high expectations so when there are challenges, they consider those challenges to be obstacles to overcome, not excuses for why things aren't happening. They focus on accountability, 
for themselves and for others in the district to do their jobs um, and so that everyone is accountable for making progress. They foster strong relationships, again, amongst themselves, um, as you just talked about, working to do, um, and for others in the district um, and in the entire school community, because those strong relationships, as some of you alluded to um, just recently, or you know, when we were going through the introductions, those strong relationships are really needed to support whatever it is that you want to be accomplishing for your students. Um, they use data to monitor progress. So knowing what data is important um, to, to dig into um, and not just looking at reams and reams of data at a very uh, superficial level. And they lead as a united team with collaboration, trust and respect amongst the team members. So some of the, um, those are some of the practices or some of the attributes, some of the practices are um, that there's that focus on student achievement, um, that um, they set goals and monitor progress towards those goals. So not only have decided where they're going to be heading, but are making sure that they're actually going to get there. Um, they engage in self-governance. So occasionally stepping back and saying, are we doing what we said we would do? Um, that will it, to enable us to move forward. Are we doing what we said we would do? How can we improve as a committee? Um, and how can we improve in our work together? And also engaging in professional development. So working to understand enough about what's going on in the world of education to do their job um, well. I think it was um, Anna who talked about, you know, could we, um, could we have enough knowledge, shared knowledge that we could step in for each other? So engaging in that time of de uh, professional development and learning their job. Um, so at a very high level, those are the um, attributes and practices of effective school committees. Anybody have any questions up until this point? I don't hear any, so I'll move on. So I talked a little bit very quickly about the fact that you are a new governance team. Um, and when we, we consider the governance team to be the school committee and the superintendent working together. Um, and it's important to understand in that, that both the committee and the superintendent have leadership roles, but from a different viewpoint. The committee is leading from a governance viewpoint and the superintendent from a management viewpoint, managing the day-to-day -day operations of the district. So the committee is looking at the end results, establishing a mission and vision, establishing goals, looking at policy and budget, and asking the big picture questions of what and why and how much. Um, particularly at goal setting time, the committee is the bridge between the community and the superintendent. So bringing, to, bringing the vision and values of the community to the table. The superintendent, as I said, is, um, is managing the day-to-day -day operations. So while the school committee is looking at the ends and looking for results, the superintendent is thinking about what are the strategies that we need to put in place to get to that mission and vision? What action plans do we need to put in place to get to our goals? Um, what regulations need to be in place and what procedures need to be in place to carry out the policies of the committee? So they're looking at the more tactical questions of how and who and when and where. And they're, they're the bridge between the staff and the committee. So they are bringing the needs of the staff to get the job done. So those two, thing, those two things, the, the school committee bringing the view of the community and the, the superintendent bringing the needs of the staff together at goal setting time come together as you move forward. So while the school committee is thinking of, is sort of in that role of authorizing the school, the superintendent is recommending things, superintendent or the school committee authorizes it, and then the superintendent implements the decisions of the school committee. Both parties have the role of, of promoting trust and mutual respect in that relationship. And I think you guys nailed it when you were talking about it before. Once all that's in place, you also have the trust of the community. So there's also a difference between being the committee and being an individual member. So outside of that committee meeting, you have no individual authority unless it's been specifically granted to you by the committee. And the committee only exists when there's a properly posted public meeting. So the committee is um, exercising its power through the official actions, 
it, again, it's governing through policy, making sure the financial resources uh, of, the, of the district are used appropriately. That's your fiduciary responsibility. Engaging the, the community in the work of the schools and again, sustaining that relationship. You're also the employer of record on a, any collective bargaining um, agreements that exist within the district. So again, as an individual member, you don't have any specific authority. Um, you um, are expected to contribute to and communicate with the rest of the committee, be ready for those discussions and asking those critical questions when it comes to those discussions at the meeting. Um, you're expected to support the committee decisions once they're made, if, you know, hopefully if a vote is not a unanimous vote and there's people on different sides of an issue, you've had a chance to discuss it. You've had a chance to have your voice heard. Um, maybe since we all know that sometimes the decisions that are made are best made when there are multiple viewpoints and multiple voices coming into a discussion, hopefully you've been able to have your impact on the decision. And once those decisions are made, you support it doesn't mean immediately changing your mind and saying, oh yes, that really was a great decision, but it means not getting in the way of the decision being carried out. Um, and then of course, everyone needs to be dedicated to the work on behalf of the students. Any questions up until this point? I'm not seeing any. Um, I was going at this point to um, do a great um, whiteboard, but you're in webinar mode, not meeting mode, so I can't use whiteboard. <laughs> Michelle was looking forward to that, I know. But um, so just um, if you think about um, the fact that we were talking about um, that, st that strong relationship needs to be in place for the effective school committee and superintendent teams, um, one of the things that, or some of the things that need to be in place to have that team um, be effective are that you do understand and respect the different roles that exist um, and that you do have agreements on operating and communicating together. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. When you're working together and you're focusing on that work that you're doing together focuses on the goals of the district um, and you maintain that focus on making sure the goals are in place and being monitored for effectiveness, um, that can help you be an effective team. Um, making sure that your meetings are efficient, um, well-planned, efficiently carried out, um, it, but able to have those good discussions that you need to have. Frequent communication um, between meetings, uh, you know, as Peter said, you wanna make sure you're not violating the open meeting law but being able to exchange the appropriate information between meetings to keep everyone um, uh, informed of what's, what's gonna happen at the next meeting or what's going on that you may need to know about. And again, having that level of trust and mutual respect within, the, um, within that governance team. So any, and not only any questions, but any thoughts about what I've just been talking about? that anyone wants to share? Just one of the things when you were talking about, it was a couple slides ago, um, the how versus the what. And one of the things that um, has been greatly improved this year over previous years was that our exposure to the leadership team was greatly increased. So we could see them presenting ideas and their vision instead of it all being filtered through the superintendent. And I think that was very helpful in just sort of building a relationship amongst, you know, all the stakeholders that are trying to do the best in the district. Okay. Anyone else? Well, I sort of have a thought um, along those lines, which is, you know, I feel like when people are playing their appropriate roles, um, Toes don't get stepped on, but also I think it really requires a lot of respect for sort of an underlying professionalism um, and knowledge. And I think it's important to just say out loud that, you know, we've hired Mary Beth as an educational expert and a leader. 
and someone who knows the business of running a district. And I think it's really important to sort of recognize that divide between higher level oversight and policy, which is what we have been asked to do on behalf of our public, but also recognizing that, you know, um, certain decisions that are not necessarily, you know, subject to the immediate micromanagement of the school committee. And I think nobody likes to feel like they're being micromanaged either direction. So I think that's important. But that said, I think for me as a, as a parent and a school committee member, sometimes you do want to sort of know what's going on in the buildings and hear from people directly. And so I think while I have a total respect for Mary Beth's role as sort of the, um, the bridge, I mean, I think that's the right word. I don't want, I, maybe this is more of a question. I don't want to feel like we ourselves cannot also speak with parents and teachers or we ourselves cannot um, have that sort of relationship. I, I, cause I think, it, you know, it's going to happen inadvertently. I have two children in the district. I'm going to be in those buildings. I'm going to have conversations with people and I don't want to have to feel like I say, Oh, roadblock, you know? So I think I would like a little bit of clarity around, um, how do we, we ourselves bridge that as both members of the community for those of us who are parents, but also respecting the fact that we are on the school committee and we have a professional expert in Mary Beth and also our teachers and our building administrators, so. Yeah, so actually in a little bit, we'll talk about um, what we refer to as the chain of command or the chain of communication, um, which gives some guidance about, you know, um, when you get questions, when you get concerns, how do those get managed? Um, and certainly that's something that um, the um, members the members who have already been on the committee can give you some feel about how it has worked. Mary Beth can certainly step in if she has um, ideas about how she would like it to work. Um, so you never lose your right, or you never lose the ability, you never stop being a parent when you're on the school committee. Um, part of the trick is that it's also hard to take off the hat. Um, sometimes I feel like it's the reverse of the emperor's new clothes. Like you think you've taken the hat off, but everyone still sees it sitting on your head. Um, so sometimes it, you need to be quite clear about, I'm here today as a parent. You know, when you walk in and you're talking to a teacher about your own children, make it clear, I'm here today as a parent. Um, and so that, so it, you're making clear to them that hat is off now. Um, and, um, you might, there are the times when you may need to be clear that you're speaking only for yourself and not speaking for the committee because sometimes when you, people know you're on the school committee when you're talking, they think whatever you say is reflective of the whole committee. So sometimes that's an important um, disclaimer to put forward as well. Um, so I don't, does, does that help? It does, yeah. I, I just wanna follow best practice and past practice, but I also know, you know, we all have different relationships in a variety of ways around the community. So mm -hmm. I look forward to unpacking that a little bit more. Okay. And does anyone on the committee or Mary Beth have anything to add to that? Yeah, one of the things that I would add that, that I found helpful in this role is that oftentimes committee members will hear things um, as, as they interact with the community that may take a while to get up to the superintendent. And if you are hearing something that you think would be important for, for me as the superintendent to be aware of, it's really helpful for me to have that on my radar screen. And I would certainly invite um, those perspectives that you're hearing about because that helps us be more responsive. And just to re reiterate what Dorothy said, and we know this, you are a parent first first and foremost, that's your, that your number one role and just stick to that. And um, the other experience of deflecting and switching hats will come with the territory. So just keep. Anything else? Okay. So we talked a little bit about um, this idea of operating protocols and the idea behind developing some operating protocols that you speak about, you know, that you articulate specifically is that people come to the table sometimes with different ideas about how things work, how we're going to communicate with each other, how we're going to operate. 
Um, Mary Beth's had experience in a couple different districts where things may have worked differently. Um, so maybe coming with some ideas or assumptions um, and that may be different than the way it's worked in Hamilton Wenham. Um, Anna and Dana may have ideas about how it works. Um, and those of you who have been on the committee um, have, you know, sort of, you. some of it's been established. I think some of it's been changing um, as the past, you know, you talked about making progress through the past year. So some of it may actually have been changing during the course of the past year. Um, so I'm gonna try and be tricky here and share a different screen, see if this works. Um, this is from your book. Um, and what I'd like to do, there's some in your book, some things in your book that we're not going to talk about tonight. Um, but this is a page in your book that um, is basically um, a lot of the things that sometimes get in the way of people being able to work together effectively. Um, and what I'd like to do is not go through everything tonight. I know this is not a standalone presentation with you've got other things that have already gone on and maybe more of your agenda after I'm done. Um, so I don't want to go through the whole thing tonight, but what I want to do is kind of start at the bottom and go through the things that are really things that happen outside of meetings. Those are the things that tend to, when we go through this whole list with districts, get the most discussion. Um, and sometimes um, get the most, uh, have the most questions about how really should it work or how really do we want it to work. Um, so what I thought I would do is a little bit of a round robin um, and pick on different ones of you um, to start at the bottom and just talk a little bit about how, um, for instance, handling co confidential information has worked for you, how you feel it should work, is it working the way you feel it should work, or um, are there any adjustments that you might want to make? Um, so I think if I'm going to start this round robin, I think um, I might start this time with David. You willing to start with that one? Sure. I was actually just pulling my pulling this, um, this up, but I'll just go from your screen. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, we're starting at the bottom with the handling yep. confidential information. Yes. Um, I think for the most part, we're very, um, very good about this, um, and can respect, um, you know, the, the important decisions that sort of have to stay or the important conversations that have to stay quiet. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, you know, I do think that it's always important to sort of reify you know what you know what it really means to keep information confidential right it, it's like there are some discussions where i make sure that there's nobody in the room with me uh, like on a zoom call all right because that, that's how important some of this stuff um is and there are others that you know just knowing how to handle a conversation if you have questions um is always you know important uh, to think about but I think for the most part that, you know, this is all, this has been handled in my experience pretty well as a board. Anyone have anything to add to that? Just, uh, you know, anything, um, anything, obviously anything that happens in executive session is confidential and it would be illegal to violate, actually illegal to violate um, executive session. Um, so that's just something good to keep in mind. I don't like our practice of getting documents that are going to be discussed in executive session when we arrive in the executive session, because I don't feel that it gives us the opportunity to seriously review those things in advance. So I would like that to me as a concern. Well, the problem with that, that I've always found and thought about was, um, you know, if you pass the information along, the information, once you sort of email it from one person to another, becomes a public document and you get into a real, real gray area at that point. You know, so how much, how much time do you want to give something that is supposed to be confidential, you know, um, time to sort of be floating out there that, you know, you can make public requests for and, you know, th things of that nature. So that's how I've always just thought about it. And 
Yeah, sure. It's always a convenient getting that information last second, but you know, when it's, and then, I mean, there are other times is you're going to find out where you don't even get the final document to a half, to a half hour before that happened tonight in tonight's conversation. So. Can I ask a clarifying question then in light of the two of your very different responses? Um, I mean, theoretically, if we are handling information from executive session, I agree with Michelle, you have to have time to properly read it. But how would it become, I guess I have a question that David said, how does it become public if it's something that's emailed only to the committee, it's not an agenda item, it's not an exhibit on an agenda item, how would it become public accidentally? I don't understand how, I don't actually don't understand how a breach would happen. Everything on our, everything on our, that we email to one another is public record. That's not necessarily true. It, it, I mean, if someone requested it and it's confidential, you could redact it or say it's confidential information. Uh, that might be something to talk to Naomi about. Right. Um, can I ask Dorothy, how um, do other districts deal with this issue? Um, I Probably lots of different ways. Um, but I, I know that there, there are districts where in their packet they would get confidential information ahead of time. Um, just to themselves. Um, and, you know, it, this is what an instance where paper packets were probably a lot easier to deal with in that regard. Um, when people got paper packets um, and could have that, it was a lot, e a lot less likely um, that you, that you ran into this type of an issue. Anything else on that one? So Michelle Horgan, since you just asked a question, can I pick on you to do that chain of communications? Sure. Um, I think for us, this is muddled. Um, I don't think there's a clear, maybe, maybe because last year was so chaotic, I think um, that there really wasn't, um, and as a new member, I didn't know where to go to, who to turn to. Um, so I really feel that this is some, an area that we need to um, um, pay attention to and have some guidelines. So Mary Beth, do you, from your experience in other districts or um, any expectations that you might have about chain of communications, do you want to step in on this one at all? Sure. I, I can tell you how we've worked this in other districts. Um, typically what we'll share with, with parents, if there's concerns, start with the person that's closest to the issue, right? So if it's a, an issue with the teacher, the conversation starts with the teacher because that's the place where it's most likely to get resolved. If, if somebody has a concern and doesn't feel like it was resolved with a, with a teacher or the person closest to the issue, then bring it to a building administrator and see if they can sort out and figure out how to solve the issue. If they bring it to a building administrator and the, the individual is still not happy with the resolution, then they can bring it to me as superintendent and I too am going to be looking at things like was policy followed, was procedures followed, that type of thing. And then if uh, an individual has felt like they have gone through all of those different steps and are still uncomfortable with the results, then that's something that could be brought to the board. Okay. Yeah, I'm not so sure that's what Michelle Horrigan was talking about though. <laughs> right. <laughs> Did I, I answered the wrong question. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, the, so this sort of came back to bite us a little bit a few weeks ago, um, and it was unintentional. Um, and, you know, in trying to help facilitate a town meeting with Wenham, I know, you know, Michelle Bailey was doing a good job as be, trying to be in communication with the chair of the um, board of selectmen um, but then he sort of used those words against her or against us in a in one of their meetings and say you know saying that Michelle was the spokesperson for the school committee and misinterpreted her words saying that you know so it sort of had this um, it really like backfiring effect on 
what the conversation actually was, <clears throat> excuse me, it, you know, and that that's a place that, you know, I, I think especially the uh, being a member of another board should have known that like, you know, that was the proper chain of communication, that that was actually a personal communication trying to build a bond between the two boards. And, you know, I, I, like, I really think that Michelle sort of got unfairly um, thrown under the bus for that conversation, but I think it really falls into this right here. <clears throat> Excuse me. So if you could go back in time, what might have, what might you have changed? So I think the issue was um, now I'm trying to remember if I used the right email account. That I don't remember. I don't remember if I used the right email account, like whether I used my personal one or my private one. But I think the real issue is, is there was a lot of stuff that needed to get done in a short period of time and we didn't have time to meet as a board. So then the question is when 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 and how do you facilitate things in time crunches and that's where the chain of command really comes into play because that's the time when the chain of command can sort of take control and communicate without necessarily having a hundred percent vote but you ha might have a sense or right. you might have a fax that you're stating or you might be able to summarize information that has happened before um like because the way i see it is now we as a board have voted michelle as our chair so she's the de facto sort of go-to person for those boards <clears throat> excuse me to to speak out in, in in that in that sense um in a situation like that happened the other you know last week or you know a few weeks ago i just think that um you know, we were trying to sort of, or Michelle was acting in best interest of not having a lot of time and, and doing things. And, you know, like I said, I just hate the fact that it got taken um, out of context and, and sort of negatively. Um, but I, I, you know, I do think that and that's something that I always had a hard time with that I got called out a lot of times when people, you know, would say to me like, well, you know, you don't have authority to say something, you know, like, well, as chair, you know, it, that really is, in, in those situations, sort of my job as, you know, as that. But I, you know, I was always very cognizant about what I would say, you know, try and say, and never try and speak on behalf of the board, only given context of what we had previously discussed, you know, but that, that was always a really difficult uh, thing for me to do when I was, was out, you know, when I was in the chair and one of the things mm -hmm. that I'm very, very happy to be giving up at the moment. <laughs> so. Can I, can I, um, can I say something? Um, I'm not sure how freeform we are here. I think some of this might be resolved. You know, we talked about the liaisons to the boards. We've talked about a communications group. I feel like some of this could be maybe in years past has been difficult because it hasn't been well defined, but it sounds like this particular new team is very communication oriented. I mean, that word has come up a lot. So I wonder if, if we just sort of establish, you know, who, who and when, and this could be part of the protocols, you know, I'm just sort of looking through all of this, but who, who is allowed to speak for the board ever and in what format and under what circumstances? So if there's an exigent circumstance, which is sort of what's been happening with this budget crisis, then maybe Michelle Bailey and, you know, Michelle Horgan, you know, help by virtue of their position on the board, maybe they have a little more latitude because we've elected them to be the chair and the vice chair. Maybe in other circumstances when we better establish the liaisons between the boards, which I know is something we need to do, then it might be different and we can sort of have a report back. So I kind of feel like if we build this into the protocols better, then maybe we won't set ourselves up to be sort of pillared in the way that Michelle has been or Dave, you have been in years past. I mean, I, I see that as a procedural thing. We can correct and establish the right channels for communicating with the public and the boards so that this doesn't happen. The other thing that I think falls into this that um, is, you know, a lot of communication should go to Mary Beth. And there are times when it's just super annoying, like you want to get something done from IT for whatever reason. But Mary Beth has to be able to 
like decide like, okay, how does that workflow happen? Does it go through her and then onto the IT people? Does it go through Janelle and then onto the IT people? Do we have the ability to contact IT ourselves? Um, you know, there's, you know, talking to our lawyer, like when is there, you know, that should go through Mary Beth. Um, you know, there's like certain things that, you know, should go through Mary Beth. There are some things that are annoying that Mary Beth has to decide, does she want to be the direct contact for those things? Or does she want us to be able to contact those people directly? And then when it comes to the time around um, the budget, like sometimes you have questions. Do those really have to go to Mary Beth so Mary Beth can ask Vinny, so that Vinny can tell Mary Beth, so that Mary Beth can tell us? Or can those questions go directly to Vinny? And that's sort of like something that we'll need to figure out what works best with a new superintendent. Um, you know, communication became very open under the last superintendent, and there was a lot of communication through a lot of people. Um, but, you know, can we maintain that long term? I don't know. So I'm just going to, I'm going to ask Mary Beth to step in, but um, I would say that there, whatever Mary Beth, I mean, it could be something that changes as time goes on and Mary Beth gets to know things better. Um, what I often say to committees is you hired the superintendent to run the district. Unless the superintendent knows the questions that are being asked, it becomes very difficult for the superintendent to run the district. Um, so that's part of the reason why there's that, that, you know, go to the, the school committee goes to the superintendent, not just to anybody in the district to get the answers, to get the information, to get something done or whatever. Um, so that out of the way, Mary Beth, jump in. Yeah, I, I think the other thing that, you know, first of all, I, I can so appreciate, and this has happened um, even more so this year with COVID is that the amount of decisions that need to occur and the kinds of questions that are being asked, it's like drinking from the fire hose and you're, you're looking to quickly get somebody an answer and it's often not feasible to get a whole group together. And I, I appreciate the complexities of that. And we probably should really unpack how to handle that because I anticipate this summer is gonna look a lot like that because the uh, fire hose, I do not believe, is going to let up. Um, and we should all understand what that is in terms of how we're going to work together with things. The, the other piece that, that I found helpful is if the board has questions or requests from, from anybody within the district, if that can go to the chair, and then the chair can bring it to me, and we can prioritize. Because oftentimes what happens in these roles is there are lots and lots of different demands on them. Um, and if everybody is just uh, approaching them all with good intent for sure, um, but then, then we get to the point where we have to say, how are we gonna prioritize this person's time? And I think that that is a really helpful conversation between the superintendent and the chair. Anything else on that? Uh, I do have a question. Um, when we hear reports of either time clock theft, equipment theft, supplies theft, who do we report that to? Or if we hear that the police were called on employees who are acting on behalf of the district, um, who do we report that to? Because I've been told a number of things and I reported it to the last superintendent and it didn't seem like it was followed up on. Yeah, you know, what I would hear, Peter, is that it would depend very much on the, the type of issue that, that may be reported to you. I, I think bringing it to the superintendent is, uh, is the, the best pathway forward. Um, and then in terms of follow-up, again, depending on what, what is uncovered, there may be places where it'd be appropriate for the superintendent to follow up on, and there'd be other places where it may not be. Um, but I think that your, your instinct there was really strong in terms of bringing it to the superintendent. I think, you know, one thing that we find when we get in these discussions is 
you're not going to find and be able to codify the solution for every possible incident that comes up that you have to sort of think generally about how things are going to be handled um, and something that people feel comfortable with. And then if when the, when the situations come up that are not quite, that are a little bit different, that are not quite in line with what you decided, then you have to make some of your best judgment about the way that goes. Dorothy, can I say two things um, on that? One of them is there's been a request from the public since we're mostly talking, and I think almost all of us have these bullet points to unshare your screen momentarily. Um, I don't know if that's something we want to do or do, but I just noted it as a request. The thing I'll say about uh, policies and protocols, I mean, that's why I think these protocols and policies are so important because there may well be times that we choose to deviate them, but if you don't have a good protocol in place, you don't realize that you're out of bounds. So I think the best part about having established practice for, you know, normally this is what we do. And then if there's something that's happening, you know, Peter, you hit a, you hear a report of something that's a, a, a danger situation or the police have to be involved. Well, that would sound like a pretty good time to maybe jump protocol, but you don't know you've jumped the rails unless you've established them in the first place. So I think that, you know, I think I want to give ourselves enough framework so we are all on the same page, but recognize that we can't control what's going to come up. And, you know, a policy isn't meant to be didactic. It's meant to be guidance. And then you have to use your judgment. And theoretically, that's what we've all been asked to do here is exercise our best professional judgment. So. Well, char charting the course makes it very clear. We do not initiate investigations. We just report what we hear, malfeasance, theft, um, theft of supplies, theft of equipment, time clock theft, you know, I'm not about to go out and do an investigation. Um, I reported it up and, and nothing's been done about it in two years. I'm just frustrated for taxpayers, for the teacher, for the, for the 24 teachers who were just laid off and staff members, you know, we could have started with the folks who were stealing from us. So um, I'm going to, I'm going to move us along. Um, so we, in some of these, other, in some of these other ones, I think, um, I think we've covered a little bit of them. So I have a question to all of you have the, the notes in front of you. So if people are hoping that I, that we don't go back to share screen, so, the, so they can see who's talking, do you have the notes in front of you? So you can just read along and we can leave it on share screen for the people who are watching. Mm -hmm. I'm seeing lots of nods, so we're going to go with that. Um, so the next one we've covered a little bit, um, but Anna, do you, it's committee member role in public, um, which is a little bit what you were talking about before. Do you have any, anything you want to add to that um, to start us off on discussing it or anything more, any other questions about it? Well, I think, um, I think this is where guidance is helpful. Um, I think that depending on the venue and the context, you know, we're always, I guess I've sort of shifted my mindset to think that I'm always, always in public, except maybe when I'm literally in my house by myself. Um, so I think it's good to be mindful that even if you say something and disclaim it, that people will assume that you have privy knowledge, they will assume that you know more. So I think I have adopted sort of a slightly more conservative mindset that, um, people are looking to us for leadership and information. So I think it's really important to, you know, my gut response, having been involved in an exactly one meeting for two hours and 15 minutes, is that it's important to say, you know, we never represent the vote of the committee. If you want to know what the committee said, you have to look at the minutes. But that said, you know, if people ask questions, I think it's, okay. in my mind, I think it's okay to say, well, it could be this, it could be that, we don't know. There's, I mean, I feel like it's important to answer questions, but not make promises and to mm -hmm. not assert that something will happen or that you can sway a decision, that you can take the information and do your best. So I kind of feel like um, to be really clear that we as individuals have no individual power and just make that very clear. But I also think to remember that even if you say you are acting as a private citizen and you happen to be in public, Everything we do reflects on us as individual members of the committee, but it also reflects on everyone else in the committee. Like we are now tethered together. So I would never want to do anything that 
looked bad for our committee because that makes our job harder. So I'm sort of mindful of our, our reputation. Um, we all reflect on each other, both good and bad. And I think that will be a guiding principle for me going forward. Okay. Well said. Uh, I think that, you know, in, in terms of representing, a, you know, if someone asks what did the committee do, obviously you can, you can talk about action that the committee took. Um, but you're right, you know, trying to, um, you know, say, well, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to take this stand or I'm going to vote this way is never, never commit your vote ahead of time because you get to the meeting, someone might say something that changes your mind. Um, so you never really want to commit your vote ahead of time there. Anything else on that? I think we kind of had covered it before. Um, Dana, I haven't uh, asked you anything. Do you want to talk at all about committee member communication between meetings? Um, well, again, having only been on the <laughs> before, <laughs> I uh, know I'm putting you on the spot, but I'd also want to <laughs> give you a uh, chance to speak. Yeah, no, so I don't, obviously I don't have a ton of insight into that. I, um, I do, I did appreciate the conversation about the appropriate way to share the confidential um, information, and I know that that hasn't, you know, there's maybe more to discuss around that. Um, but um, I guess, so I guess I don't have a ton to say about that, except to say that it is really important that there are, um, communications are accessible or, you know, to the members so that we know what's going on. And also I am aware that there are concerns around not trying to have um, deliberations or discussions like that. And so, yeah, yeah. Um, but so far, all the communications has been clear. I got <laughs> all the information I got and I was good so far. Um, I will add though, as now a year under my belt, it's important though to get, like you said, Dana, to get information. You don't want to discuss a topic, but it's important to have some type of historical perspective or just some information to help with your decision. So. And, and I maybe to jump in, even the in town conversation, like, we, you know, um, you know, things that are just going on at the schools, the things that are happening, like it, that is helpful. Not everybody is not at all of the school, you know, events or all the school, you know, so that kind of thing, just informationally is going to be important and helpful, um, you know. Yeah. So I'm going to tie this together then with communication with between the committee and the superintendent between meetings and ask Mary Beth to jump in a little bit. Um, Cause I think those two things tie together just Mary Beth before you start, um, because you mentioned the open meeting law and information versus deliberation. Um, the open meeting law prevents deliberation between the meetings or outside of a, outside of a public meeting or between a quorum. It does not prevent the sharing of information. Um, so that's a, so sort of an important delineation. So with that, Mary Beth, you want to jump in? Sure. So a couple things that I, I think I've had this conversation with all committee members at this time. One of the practices that I'm hoping to continue, we started it with this meeting, is a call to each committee member before the meeting. But after you've had a chance to actually look at the agenda and the associated documents so that you have an opportunity to ask clarifying questions. And if there's something that you want um, presented at the meeting or questions that you want answered, that gives me a head up, heads up so that I can have the appropriate people at the meeting to be able to respond to you. So that's, that's one strategy that I, I think is helpful. Um, another piece that I would offer is that there are sometimes things that happen in school districts that uh, the community will be aware of and there'll be a lot of conversation around. Um, sometimes um, behavioral issues or something major that the entire community is most likely going to be aware of. One of the practices that I try to have is if, if I know that that's, that's happening, I would reach out to board members and share the information with you at a level of confidentiality that, that would be um, expected. 
but that you're not blindsided by something that's happening in the district because oftentimes community members will come to you and say, you know, what's happening here and you don't want to, you don't want that to be the first time that you hear about it. So if I, I see a situation like that, you'll, you'll notice that I'll be reaching out to you around that. Um, the, the other piece that I would share is that I do think that relationships and open door policies are helpful. So I'm, I'm here to answer questions if you have them um, that in between meetings um, and would encourage people and invite people to reach out if you're hearing something that you, you'd like some clarification on or if you um, know it's an issue in front of the board and just need um, additional information, I'm certainly happy to provide that. Anything else on that? Okay, I'm going to jump to um, individual members requesting information or action directly from staff members. Who have I not? Peter. I'm not sure that you started anything off yet, so go. You mean when I request information or when I hear information? Because this says- When you request information. Well, I've always been told that that goes through the chair or through the superintendent. Um, and that's what I usually do. And I don't know of any other way to do it because requesting information or action directly from staff members. No, I think there's a very clear line between our role as a school committee and the superintendent's role of running the district. So I, I do not ask anything from staff members other than requesting from the superintendent um, information or passing along information. So I've always been very clear about that line. Okay. Kind of goes back to what I said before about, you know, the superintendent needs to know um, what's the, what the questions are that are being asked and needs to have the ability to manage her staff, her staff's time and her staff's work appropriately. Um, without school committee members going and, and asking for things um, that she may not be aware of. Um, anything else, anyone else on, on that? Which I just, I just want like to say, that is like so hard sometimes because there are, we do over time develop relationships with other people. Um, and so it, it, you do have a familiarity with them. So sometimes it is really hard to wait to get an answer, but you still need to kind of go through the process. And, you know, it just is what it is. We're not employees and we're not the manager. We're not the leaders of the district per se. We're not the leaders of the staff of the district. We're the leader, leaders of the leader of the district. So it's not, it's hard. So you just have to just draw the line and yeah. be, solid in it yeah so I often say you know the the, the school committee only has one employee um, and that is the superintendent um, conversely the superintendent only has one boss and unfortunately sometimes for the superintendent that boss has seven heads but right. <laughs> but only has one boss and can only um, only the committee as a whole can even give direction to the superintendent well, I was going to say something piggyback on what Michelle said, which is in this scenario, since we all have these relationships, it's a great example of just because we could get information doesn't mean that it's the right way to do it. So I feel like there's a good, it's a good way just to remind yourself that if it's official district business, it goes through Mary Beth, even though I, even though I might talk to the teacher that I have a question about might be right next to me. If it's about the district, it's not appropriate to go direct. So I kind of feel like it, you don't want to undercut your superintendent. I mean, that's, that's setting her up for failure. And I think it also would then speak to sort of that um, muddy communication from the community and lack of professionalism on our part. If we're really good about drawing that line, then people will see that we respect it and they'll follow it and they'll know that, no, you're not going to get us to do something for you and you can't rely on us for something secret. Like, Everything goes through Mary Beth. And I think that's an important, I think that's, I mean, to me, this seems really clear actually. Okay. Any other comments? I'm, I'm keeping an eye on the time. 
and I don't want to take too much of your evening knowing that you've already had some meeting time and um, I don't know if what more you have to do but you know it was probably a pretty busy day especially for Mary Beth so <laughs> don't want to keep you too long um, so I'm going to stop there and ask you to think a little bit about um, you know, Anna specifically, I think, talked about uh, developing some, some protocols or some guidelines uh, or guardrails that you're going to follow. I gave you in the workbook that I sent you the ones that um, Hamilton Wenham had a couple years ago. Um, we often talk about those protocols being a very flexible document that should be able to change as the team changes. They might not be right anymore which is why I gave you a couple other samples to look at. Um, but I think it would be, I mean, some of this, it sounds like you all agree um, that there's more discussion to have about some of these items and about establishing yourselves as a working team. Um, so just if we can just leave with a, a couple thoughts about moving, moving forward, how will you get to continue this discussion and get to a set of protocols or norms or guidelines um, that feel right for everybody. Anybody want to jump in? Michelle, Mary Beth, Michelle, Bailey? I think we're going to have a retreat hopefully in August where this can be part of that discussion, um, you know, and where we can compare and contrast and decide what is and what isn't still applicable. I know David and I had a quick conversation. He's like, well, the protocols are only as good as you know, the behaviors that stand behind them. So we want to be sure that we get agreement because that's how you get mm -hmm. um, coherence with what they actually are versus if there's dissent around what the protocols are, you might not, protocols aren't worth anything because nobody's willing to, you know, abide by them, so. Right, and that's why we suggest signing them and voting on them to sort of, you know, that people actually did make a commitment to following them together um, and, you know, sometimes just the fact that you talk about them, the fact that you agree to them, if, if you start to wander away, it gives someone a piece of paper to say, you know, we agreed to this rather than, well, I assumed this was the way we were going to work. Um, you spelled it out more specifically. And I think that that is really helpful um, in, in developing that team that's going to work together with those agreements about, again, how you're going to work so that you're not stumbling up on the how, but you can get to the what's the work that we need to get done. Make sense? Mm -hmm. The okay. other thing I would add, Dorothy, is in this moment where we have so many things that are important and urgent, this falls under the important but not urgent, <laughs> and that we, we should really be intentional around making space to do this kind of work because I do think it will be so helpful in terms of building a strong team. Michelle, I'm gonna try a, a whiteboard and see if I can get this to work. So if you look at this on your screen, you should be able to see a bar, you should be able to see annotate on your on your function bar or your bar of different options do people see that no you don't see it oh where do you see it dana do you, you should on the same line that you see um mute stop video chat uh q a up well up top if you click on view options there's a pull down menu and it says annotate is that what you're talking about yes it is yeah, yeah do I people don't. see it or not I do no. not. If you don't see it, then we won't do it. Okay. Really? You see something different up there, Dana. I still see manage participants and show chat. Up at the very top, it's it says the very top your, under view your, options. Your Dorothy Presser's screen at the oh, top. Oh, yeah. View and options. View options, and you click on that, and then below that, there's annotate. Yep. There's the green okay. bar. Yeah. And then yep. the view options. Okay. Okay. So if you click on annotate, it'll bring up another bar. Yep. Yep. And if you um, click on text, you can type something in one of these spaces. So if you think about um, the work that we did this evening, was there something that really squared with what you already know? Was there something that completed a circle of knowledge for you? Did you get a new angle on something? Or is there something more that you want to um, think about or work more on? 
So if you click on text, you can just put a thought in one of those boxes if you want. I'm on an iPad, so I don't, I can't do that. Ah, well. And Peter, we appreciate that you're using the district issued way you're supposed to be doing it. So thank you for following the process. Ah, okay. Relationships are critical in a high functioning. Oops. <laughs> <laughs> Wait a sec. High functioning oh. something or other. Yeah. <laughs> Let's see. If someone wants to write in there that there's a clear line between school committee role and the superintendent's role. Where would you like that, Peter? Probably squared with what we already know. I think we, I think we, as a committee, Ooh. are pretty clear of that. Okay, I, I had it on cap locks, so it looks a little weird, but there it is. Because <laughs> you're yelling? Because <laughs> <laughs> I was doing something else while I was waiting for you guys. <laughs> a Trump tweet. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody want to add anything else or should we call it a night? I think this is great, Dorothy. Okay. Thank you for sticking to the time. It's been very helpful. All right. Well, I'm going to stop my share so everybody can see everybody again. So, um, you know, I'm around if you want, um, if you want to work more on any of the other pieces of the district governance project, um, I'm here. If you want to continue this and have some facilitation, I'm here. Um, you know where to find me. Excellent. So, Thank Dorothy, um, since I'm um, always wanting to to learn and self improve, so I'll do all of the charting, the course. But are there other um, training things that you can direct us to? I would be very eager to know. I mean, I'm willing to read any stitch of paper, or any any bit of webinar to try to do this job as best I can. So, if you have other resources or professional groups, um, Michelle Bailey's been good about kind of sharing professional working groups with me, but I would love to, I want to be a super overachiever school committee member. So, okay. so let me tell you I, I, in about two minutes, so I don't take up too much time. So, um, you'll learn more about this at charting the course, but MESC has divisions. Um, that are geographic divisions. The divisions hold meetings on different topics periodically. Um, we This year, um, we won't be having the usual in-person November conference, um, given the state of the nation right now. Um, but we will be substituting that with various um, professional development opportunities throughout the course of the year, like one or two a month um, coming up, so you can watch for those different opportunities. Um, if you want to do some quick reading, there's a book called The Essential School Board Book. There's also a book called The Governance Core um, about school committee uh, work, which you might find. Um, they're both thin, relatively quick reads, but full of good information. Um, ah, David is showing you The Essential School Board Book. Um, it, was written by, it was written by Nancy Walzer, who's a former member of the Cambridge School Committee. What was um, the second book? Uh, the second book was the governance core. Um, I believe the gentleman who wrote it, his last name is Pew P U G H. Um, I think they're both. I think they're both on Amazon, um, so easy to get. Um, and you know, MESC is available as a resource. We answer the phone. We answer emails. So if you ever have any questions of us. Um, me, you know, I'm your field director to, you know, field any questions um, that you might want. So we're here as a, as a resource and you can also, you know, poke around on our website. You'll see lots of different things there that, okay, Super. anything else? No. All, All right. right. Well, it was great to see everybody again <laughs> um, and hopefully see you again fairly soon. Thanks, Dorothy. Yeah. You'll be seeing some people soon because they'll be in touch with you to do a policy meeting this month. Yeah, that was, my, right. that was my question. Who, who, how are we going to coordinate this? Who's reaching out? Because, Michelle, you always did that for us. Yeah, Peter, I'll give you Dorothy's um, phone number and you can just get in touch with her. Perfect. Thank yeah. you. Thank you, Ms. Presser, for everything. All right. Super. Okay, good night. Okay, so...
I have that we need to cover E on the agenda, which was um, oh, liaisons to different schools and stuff. Um, and also to the whatever, whoever we want to have liaisons with. Um, I think it, that can wait till next week, just because I don't know who you're going to be liaisoning with when like there aren't really even people around. So if we could do that next week, it'll save us some time. Um, and then F, what is F? Oh, vote. vote on the summer meeting. <laughs> Meetings. So um, I just went in and looked at the Google form, Mary Beth, to see. Um, so it's kind of weird, like 100% of the people are available in the evening on the 10th and the 12th. But the five people who voted, it was kind of like three people would rather have it in the morning and <laughs> two people would rather have it at night. But yet the one that has the most availability. So we should check with those who did not respond. Um, if we wanted to have like a retreat that potentially was somewhere outside-ish, um, would you be available on the 10th or the 12th? My preference personally is the 12th, but... Um, Where's there an outdoor bar? Well, you know, one thought was maybe we could b brown bag it. <laughs> <laughs> At the tea house, but there might be, I mean, there may be other places we, you know. Well, isn't the tea, the tea house went out of business, they closed. Yeah, that's why we could brown bag it. You'd have to bring yeah, your own because there's nobody there. But, you know, I know, might, I know Mary Beth had a retreat somewhere recently and, you know, so we could look into that if that's what we want to do. Um, so David, you didn't respond. Did, is the 10th or 12th? In yeah, the I was just looking that up. Are we talking July or August? Oh, August, yeah. <clears throat> um, and Vinny, you're not available either, like from pretty much the 1st of August through it, like the middle, late August, right? I'm available the 1st to the 14th. Oh. And then not after that. <clears throat> oh, okay. I thought it was a different time frame. Okay. So, great. It was the one on the 20th. 27 whatever the 20th day was I can't okay, great. um yeah i was holding off because i was waiting to try and get game schedules <clears throat> excuse me uh if we could do early both are fine what do you mean by yeah. early like you know you would add, i know it asked for like morning or evening. So if it was like morning, it doesn't matter. I can, I'm I'm free. I'm just free. But it's uh, more five of the people who responded were available at night from five to eight. I can be available in the morning if I was one of them. I have I just responded at, that I'm available for everything. I'm free like the air. I'm not available in the mornings. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> Um, I'm just trying to figure out, I don't even have my schedules. So, uh, no matter which one we pick, I'm sure it'll be the wrong one because I don't have my other schedules in front of me, but so either they, they hold equal weight to me at this point. The 12th is the Wednesday. So, um, do it. Yeah. But I know the, uh, both teams I coach tend to play Mondays and Wednesdays. So. Um, and then Stacy didn't respond, so we'll just have to ask her. So, do we want to just try and find a place then, Mary Beth, and we can make it based on that? We can their availability. Yeah, why don't we do a little bit more research, and we'll we'll bring a a date and a location in terms of a proposal for next week. Okay, that sounds great. Okay, um, but it looks like you do have the answer, like people are comfortable if we can do an outdoor social distance. Okay. Or potentially, I don't know how people feel about the, the walls of Buker <laughs> if we have to, um, you know, with the windows open kind of thing. So, um, okay. All right, so there's that. So then we should talk about the rest of the calendar. I have, I have a large pop-up, like a, 12 by 12 pop-up tent we could always use too. If it's right, right, I was going to say, the Boy Scouts have their gigantic one that goes over like three picnic tables. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Um, 
Okay. So then the rest of the calendar, we would be looking to meet next week, um, mostly because um, Mary Beth's first day was today. She might have some stuff she wants to talk about next week. And um, also the town meeting. And then on the 29th of June, um, the 12th would potentially be our retreat day. So, um, and then take a little bit of a break until the second. Um, Vinny, is the 12th, the 29th going to be too soon to do line item transfers? Like, will, will we meet your needs? Uh, are you saying August? No, I'm saying, can you do, would you be ready on July 29th to do line item transfers? So the auditors are in that week. It would be the one after that. So that's, that's when they finalize. The retreat date, which is the 12th. And so we really wouldn't want to do it then. So we may have to have another meeting then. That's all. Okay. Um, Michelle, if we had the um, if we had the retreat on the 10th, could we then still meet on the 12th? Yeah, we could. And so, that, would solve, that would solve the line item problem. That yeah. Would... yeah, that might be what we'd have to do. For me. Okay, great. Super. You can get that all done and then you can be like free as a bird for the rest of the month. Yep. <laughs> Which will be good for you. Okay. Um, all right, so now I gotta try and get back to the agenda. Do we have to vote on the schedule? Yeah, we probably should because the bylaws say that we'll vote. Mm -hmm. So um, I make a motion that the Hamilton Women's School Committee accept the 2020-2021 summer school committee meeting schedule as presented with a change or an addition for the oh, retreat date. We need a second. <laughs> <laughs> Did we fire you as a as secretary? Well, she's, I have a second. David's going <laughs> to. All right. So uh, we're going to do that by, is anybody want to discuss any of the rest of the dates? And um, while we've been meeting online, we've been meeting at six o'clock. Um, so we'll continue that, but it's, I don't know what will happen once we come back to ever meeting in person. So we'll just assume they're at six o'clock. Okay. Um, Dana. Yes. Michelle Bailey. Yes. Um, Michelle Horgan. Yes. David Polito. Yes. Anna Cizik. Yes. Peter Walzik. Yes. Okay, great. Um, all right, so Mary Beth sent us an email with a, whatever, a non-adjective document from the DESE. And so she, I think she wanted to have just a few statements about that. We'll probably have some more in-depth discussions in the near future. Thank you, Michelle. I have a, a couple of quick slides to walk through again, just to give you the bird's eye view in terms of what's happening with the latest announcements from the state. So um, I'm going to share my screen right now, just make sure everybody can see it. Let's see. Maybe not. Vinny, it's interesting. I'm not seeing my... should be at the bottom. Yeah, I, I see where to share it, but when I'm sharing it, I'm not seeing my doc. Let's see. Let's try this. Do you have to click on desktop and then... Yeah, usually when I share, you can see the document you're trying to see, share right there. Let's see. Um. I can run over there if you want me to. You know what I, I think it is? I have my new computer today and I'm thinking that it may not be set. Let's see. Put on your mask, Vinny. Um, you know what, I'm, I've got some ch challenges sharing, so I can probably just speak to the points that are on the slides so that we can continue to move along. 
<laughs> yeah. So a couple of things that I, I think are important here is that what we know right now is that the state has released its initial guidance for the fall opening. And I think the realities here are important to continue to keep in front of us. School systems everywhere are facing uncertainties. Answers are going to evolve and we may get some answers and then they may change. And that is just where we are as a nation right now. Uh, what the initial guidance is telling us is that we need to be prepared for three scenarios, a return in person in the fall, a hybrid model, and a fully remote model. And one of the things that has happened since the last update you had is that the state is now sharing that they are receiving some medical guidance that is informing where they would like us to place our emphasis. Um, what this guidance is telling them is that students are less likely to be infected than adults, that students are less likely to spread um, the, the disease than adults. They've looked at countries where schools have opened and they are not finding schools to be partic uh, particular hot spots in terms of transmitting the disease and that there are other risks in terms of not having students back at schools, such as academic needs and social emotional needs. And that based on this, what their new medical guidance is, is that it is possible to return to in-person schooling if we can maintain three feet social distancing um, and as a result of that, the, what we are hearing from the state is to put an emphasis on being prepared to reopen for in-person learning in the fall. Um, we are still being asked to have a hybrid model in place and to have the potential to switch to fully remote, but this is the area of emphasis that is now being um, put forth. So where are we right now as a district? Um, currently what is happening is that there is a full analysis of space utilization across all of the buildings so that we can be able to understand whether or not we would be able to meet that three foot social distancing requirement. Um, we've got uh, our, our buildings and grounds director, Tom Geary, and our principals. Um, I actually walked through all the buildings today um, looking at square footage, looking at class size, and doing an analysis. So we, sh we are hoping within the next couple of weeks we will be clear as to whether or not we have the space within our buildings to, to meet that requirement. Um, we also know that we are going to have to be ordering PPE, um, which is personal protective equipment. We know we're going to have to look at furniture because of the three foot social distancing rule where so many of our classrooms have tables as opposed to individual desks. So that's something that's out there. And that we know because we have been asked to be prepared to move fully remote, should the circumstances require that, we know that we're gonna to have to be looking at the device issues for students. Because when we have a, a mandate for free public education and the only way to access that education is through a device, we're gonna to need to be sure that those are in place. Once we have a sense of what, where we may be going with all of this, then we have to answer the questions, what will it cost and where are we going to get the funding from? Um, so all of these questions are kind of swirling right now and they are evolving. Mary Beth, can I ask you a question about, about that? The, um, and I, I don't want to get into the weeds because it's just too much and it's not efficient. But there were two things that came out of the recommendations to me that popped as something that I'd like to know that we're thinking on now, even though we know everything's going to pivot. One of them was the suggestion of using community spaces for overflow and the idea that, you know, we might be using gymnasiums for classrooms and cafeterias for classrooms. But I was wondering if, if there's been consideration of using community spaces that might be available and if that outreach has happened and if so is that something we're thinking about is that something we're contemplating or you know would we want to approach 
you know, someplace like the, the community house has a big room. I'm just thinking about, you know, they, the documents suggested community centers, the documents suggested libraries. We do have some community resources that have overflow rooms that we could theoretically ask about. And I'm just wondering if that's something we want to consider or have considered or is that on the radar? Um, so that's one question. Okay. And the other question that really jumped out at me is being a, a, a quagmire of epic proportions is on the bottom of page 14, it talked about if you have to consider a hybrid model giving priority to high need students, which from an instructional point of view um, and from sort of a legal point of view makes absolute sense. But I can see as a community that would be a source of great, great, great unrest if certain families, you know, their children end up at school five days a week and other families do not. I would be really curious to know how, how we've thought about that because I feel like that's going to be a really sticky question for us. And I'm, I just wanted to raise those now because I think the more deliberate we are about those answers, which we're going to have to be able to provide, the better. I don't think those should be rushed questions later on. Yeah, th thank you for the for that, Anna. And what I would say in terms of community resources, the, the first step that we're taking right now is to understand whether or not we can meet this three foot social distancing rule within our existing buildings. And then once we know whether or not that is possible, we'll also know where we're where and if we're falling short. And then that would be the time that we would start looking for alternative spaces. Um, I would absolutely echo your sentiment that the, the hybrid model is certainly the most complex and the most controversial. Um, we have not begun planning for that yet. We, we will have some design teams in, we'll be doing some thinking. Um, I think that we will have a plan if that needs to happen, but I, I think that we are going to be spending most of our time and energy looking at what happens if everybody's in and what happens if we're fully remote. I, that the hybrid model, I think, is going to be incredibly complex. Um, we will have to have an answer for it, um, but in terms of thinking about where most of our energies are going, I think that the other two models are probably more likely. Um, and so you'll see probably information coming about that first. The, the other thing that I would share in response to your concerns is that as part of our model, we are going to be reaching out to the community to get feedback and ask for the different perspectives that people have around all three models. Um, and as, as often as the case in controversial issues, I suspect that we'll find multiple perspectives out there. Um, and that is where um, we will be working together as a team to figure out what is the best collective response for this district. Yeah, and I think when we talked about this before the meeting that you had said that probably early August, you would be looking at engaging parents in some sort of a focus group type thing. Correct. So we have a couple of things in place right now. Um, the last week in July, we have 25 plus teachers coming in for a full design week where we're going to be talking about, okay, what is this going to look like if we're three foot social distancing? How do we build meaningful educational experiences for kids in those kinds of environments? What if we had to go fully remote? What if we had to go hybrid? And really getting folks that are on the front lines to, to give a lot of deep thought to that. The following week after that, which will be the first week in August, we're going to have um, both our core leadership team and an expanded leadership team in the district looking at some of the work that the teachers have created, um, vetting that with parents, vetting that with students, vetting that with our entire um, staff and teaching group so that you will see you'll see some surveys coming out and we'll also look at some focus groups so I think probably what you're looking at is the end of the first week in August when we will be in a position to actually put forth a plan for people to respond to um, this this is complex work um, and it will probably take us that long to put something worthy of careful consideration by the community. Um, I think we're going to need that length of time in order to do that. 
And you'll communicate that through our regular communication channels of email and Twitter and all of that stuff. Right. And one of the things that, that I'm looking to put into place is a district newsletter where we'll be putting out information as well. Um, so using both current communication tools and then looking to see if there may be some additional ones that would be helpful for the community. Yeah. Okay. And then the, you know, the only thing I'll just kind of end with again is this idea that, that we are, we are facing a situation where there are so many uncertainties and answers will evolve. <laughs> And the reality, particularly when we're looking at what's happening with the virus right now, is we may get answers and have a plan, and then the plan may need to change. And I, I think we can acknowledge that that's unsettling for everyone. It's unsettling for parents, it's unsettling for the community, it's unsettling for teachers and staff. Um, and you know, we're gonna get through this together. Um, and we know that flexibility and agility are going to be really critical words as we move forward. And ju just, I, I, this was sent out to community members, but in the agenda, there is a link to the full guidance from the state. So if you're interested in, in reading what is happening at this moment in much greater detail, that resource is there for you. All right. Um, does anybody have any questions or comments they want on that? I would just say good luck. <laughs> um, okay. Thank you. So, um, yeah, and then though the places that Anna had just mentioned to you were not ones that you and I had talked about as yeah. being potential. So, you know, those are even, those are actual ones that actually belong to the town. So, you know, those may be, one is a gym. There's actually a gym available to the town. So. Yeah. I think one of the things that we we're very fortunate about is that there does appear to be a number of different resources yeah. in Hamilton and Wenham that could be tapped if we need them. And that, that certainly is encouraging and reassuring. Yeah, it's not, we're not building poor. We actually have lots of buildings, so we're lucky in that way. Okay, so there's an enrollment report, you know, my favorite, because I don't know why we see this, but we do every month. Um, do you guys want to say anything about it? Yeah, we're good. Great, there's an enrollment report. Um, <laughs> Oh, we're looking on that seven. I actually like seeing them. Like, I'm glad that we do it because it's a question that always comes. Oh, it's good. It's good. And now that I know that it's created anyways for no for the state, it's fine. David, did you have something you wanted to say? Just wondering how that uh, kindergarten class is looking. Yeah. So I don't think that's in there, but are we still at the 140, 130 something? Do you know of any? I think that is the latest number. And it, it's looking like we're leaning towards needing the seventh yeah. kindergarten. Okay. And Vinny, did you by any chance get anything back about um, auditing the enrollment report? Uh, so we are not allowed to issue the town any in student information directly, but we can engage Powers and Sullivan to conduct an audit over it um they did give me a quote that it would be somewhere between five and ten thousand and this is because someone brought up okay so now we have that information yeah for what though why do we need that information because one of the towns wanted to know if we could if they could get the information and verify their percentage enrollment and we were not we were not sure that we could allow them access to student information so we've had that confirmed um, and so now we do know a price so if that we can go back to them if, and say you know this is how much it would cost if you would like to have it paid for if you would like to pay for it so that was a verbal quote. We would have to write out kind oh, of absolutely. complete agreed upon procedures before they could properly it, quote it. Right. They need to know, you know, it's in the ballpark of 
thousands of dollars. And if that's worth it to you, then absolutely we would accept yep. a grant funds or whatever to do that work. So, okay. Yep. All right. Uh, I'm, not asking, want it. I'm not asking the ed fund for that. No, no, no. The town would be the All great right. drawer of the money, <laughs> in my opinion, because they're the ones who want the information. Yeah, no, that's it. They want it, yeah. they can pay for it. Yeah, and we'd be happy to facilitate it. So, um, okay. So now we are on to, I don't think any of the subcommittees have met other than negotiations, but. Just so you know, the negotiations, we have three meetings scheduled, um, the 15th, 22nd, the 29th, yeah. four o'clock with HWEA and five o'clock with um, custodial and um, maintenance. So depending on what happens, we'll cancel, keep and cancel. Yeah. So we'll have to get with Mary Beth to find out when she thinks we'll have something that's even to discuss with them. <laughs> but, um, okay. Great. Um, so we have the consent agenda left, which includes um, vouchers, which are the bills or warrants, which are the bills that we've paid and uh, several sets of minutes. Mm -hmm. um, so I make a motion that we approve the oh, consent. Wait, wait. Does anybody want to pull any of those? Anna. Um, I have a question about just procedurally, if it's a consent agenda and both items are grouped together, I don't know that I feel comfortable approving minutes to meetings that I was not a party to. I mean, I've read uh, them, but I was not a party to them. So I, should I abstain from the minute part of it? By Robert's rules, you do not need to. Um, but if you want us to, we can separate them into two consent agendas. Do you want to do that? I think I would. I mean, if we're going to be proceduralist, I think I would prefer to make that clear. And then the consent agenda, if there's anything in there that you want to discuss anything about, you pull it and then we discuss it. So, you know, if your name is misspelled in the minutes, you pull those sets of minutes and we'll correct that, okay. um, that kind of thing. But otherwise there's no discussion once we've. Right. That's what I wanted to ask because yeah. I just didn't want to blindly approve minutes that I wasn't a member of. So. Um, all right. So Michelle, do you want to do two uh, more? Uh, is it do I pull now or do I pull it later? Yep, yeah, go ahead, pull now. Uh, just the minutes for April 7th. Great, we'll pull the minutes for April 7th. Okay, all right, so I make a motion that we approve um, the um, consent, consent agenda um, for warrants um, and no changes can be made. Great, we need a second. I'll second. Great. Um, okay, Michelle Horrigan has made the motion. Anna Cizek has seconded. We'll do a roll call vote. Dana? Yes. Michelle Bailey? Yes. Michelle Horrigan? Yes. Uh, yes. David Plato? Uh, Anna? David Plato, yes. Yes. Anna and Peter? Yes. Fantastic. All right. Um, then we would have a second consent agenda related to minutes. We will not include April, April 7th. 7th. Yep. So I make a motion that we approve the consent agenda consisting of the vote. Uh, um, approved prior meeting minutes with the exclusion of April 7th, 2020. Do we have a second? Second. Great. Um, seconded by David Polito. Um, so there's no discussion. So Dana. Um, I, can, I think I would abstain because I agree with Anna. <laughs> That's fine. Michelle Bailey. Yes. Um, Michelle Horgan. Yes. David Polito. Yes. Anna. Abstain. And Peter. Yes. Okay, so that was four yes and two abstain. So we'll call that as passing. Um, we had April the 7th held. Um, Peter, what would you like to say about that? Uh, well, it seems silly, but I haven't missed a school committee meeting in two years, and I just don't see my name what? on there. <laughs> um, You're I, correct. Your I, name I, is not on there. Oh, so sorry. And I'm, um, I'm just I'll wondering. Make changes if, to did it. Did I miss something, or because I thought I had in my notes that I was there? You're there. You're there. Well, I'll actually, make weird though, because you're not in the roll call vote either, Peter. Well, that's right. That's why I'm. I'm, I'm having Peter, a doubt. I, I mean, I, having watched those meetings, there was one meeting. I'm not sure you were there. Um, um, you know what I can do? Um, I will go back and review the meeting April seventh. Um, the recording of it, and I'll see if um, 
okay. if you were there, and I'll put them on the agenda for next week. April 7th was a Tuesday. No, Tuesday? Because here it's like, Wednesday. Yeah, no, April 7th, Tuesday. So I'll, April 7th. Hmm. Yeah, now that now that you say that, David, there was a, a there might have been a very brief meeting, uh, like a half. Yeah, this one's only a half hour long. That for some reason I didn't know about, or or was confused that it was on Wednesday, and so maybe I. I that sounds vaguely familiar, Peter. Let's just check it. Let's just double check it and we'll vote on it next week. Hey, yep. hey guys, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, ma'am. Hey, um, so that meeting wasn't, um, it wasn't published on HW Cam, like it wasn't recorded. Yeah. Okay. If you guys recall that. Um, so there was no way to review it, but as far as I recall, Peter was not there and it was, to the best of my recollection, the only meeting that Peter has ever missed. Right. Yeah, because I think there was a confusion about whether it was Tuesday or Wednesday, and I think I missed it because I thought it was Wednesday. Yeah, I think that is what happened. I'm just looking at the note, like what happened. Yeah. But it was a, it was, yeah, the the it notes on that meeting. It was a very brief meeting. I think the sole purpose mostly was for executive session. Yeah. Um, it was very brief. So, so the regular session meeting minutes are um, basically Be just to go into executive session. Because I, d I was present for the meeting where we talked about the language of the memorandum of understanding and, and there was a lot of discussion around number five. And, and I remember that, hearing with Jean we had Lee. Two we had two meetings. We had one meeting where we discussed a lot of the language and then we had the one meeting where we were like, and we and then we sent that to them, and then they sent them, then they sent us back language, and then we approved it. Yeah. So maybe we're at the first one, but that's fine. We yeah. can. Vinny has the Zoom recording, probably, so we can probably just go back and check the Zoom recording. Yeah. Now, now, now that you say it, it, because I was looking at the Wednesday, and I was like, I've never missed a meeting, but there was a meeting that I thought was Wednesday, and oh, it happened okay. on Tuesday, and I missed it. So it very well could be. So if we want to approve it as is, that's fine. Um, okay. Just, I don't want Vinny to have to do extra work because I have a doubt in my memory. Okay. Know? If you're feel so, comfortable with it, Peter, we're happy to. Yeah. Well, okay. I'll just abstain, that's all. Well, if you abstain and Dana abstains and Anna abstains, we're gonna have a three to three vote. So let's just check it. No, it's a three nothing, that's a three nothing vote. It's not a negative. Um, I'll work with Vinny over the next week. Uh, but it is it, but it is it the majority. Work. But it's not a majority, so it won't count. So let's just I'll to prove it. I'll just approve it. That's fine. I don't want. I just do not want to create extra work for Vinny or Michelle. Okay. okay. All right. So um, there's um, nothing controversial there. So yeah, the funny thing is that because I'm looking at the negotiation subcommittee meeting from before that, and there's nothing in there. I think we discussed Mary Beth contract. Is really the meat. Yeah, the I think that. I think that now that you say that, David, that that was it, and I learned about it after the fact. So, okay. Yeah. So let's let's get it done so we don't create work for Vinny and Michelle. Okay. I make a motion Here. that the Hamilton Women's School Committee approves the meeting uh, minutes from the April seventh, twenty twenty meeting. Give me a second. I'll second it. Thank you. Seconded by David Plato. Um, I guess this is not really in consent. We've had plenty of discussion probably. Okay, good. Uh, we'll go to a roll call vote. Dana. Upstain. Michelle Bailey, yes. Michelle Horgan. Yes. Uh, David Polito. Yes. Anna Sizek. Upstain. And Peter Walzik. Yes. Thank you. Where's your sense of adventure? It's, it's <laughs> so, Come on, guess, sure. It looked good. Got, um, the topics for the next uh meeting so um we'll talk about liaisons and maybe we'll talk about other working groups probably not we'll probably do that at the retreat maybe we'll do all of that at the retreat we'll see um we do need to talk about town meeting and actually mary beth and david and i probably need to just 
be authorized to make some decisions about the documents that are going to be handed out at the Wenham Town meeting because they're wanting them sooner than the last minute, um, <laughs> which Hamilton was fine with. So um, do are people fine with that? Mm -hmm. okay. um, can I put in a request to put that anti-racism uh, resolution on the agenda for next week? Yeah, that's from the MASC. Mm -hmm. I, I agree with that. That's important. Yep. Okay. Trump, Trump today called Black Lives Matter a hate group. Yes, they do. They hate racists. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and it, I, I, I'm sorry. I shouldn't have said that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, I will try better to be better. Anything else? Um, Mary Beth will put together other items. So the challenge is obviously when we have these weekly meetings, getting the documents ready by Friday is a big challenge. So we will do our best, um, but much like the workbook, if things are put in later, um, you'll, it'll be emailed to you as soon as possible and I will try and text you to let you know, um, and, which was helpful because Peter was left off of the original email this time. So we were able to make sure that he got the document because he knew that the document should have been there and it wasn't so he was good to go on that um, um i'm the messaging is just going to stay the same I, I i'm just imagining that we're just gonna fine tune a little bit just for when i'm we won't be able to make any presentation so if we want to have slides printed out we're going to need to get that done and and that sounds that sounds like a town board that's really supportive of our budget that's well, what that sounds like to me there's going to be no AV because they didn't want to pay for the LED projector, given the cost of the tent and the flooring and all of that stuff. So we needed flooring. So the presentation that Dr. Kuchenberger presented at the Hamilton Town meeting was how many slides? It wasn't that long, I don't think. No. So yeah. So theoretically, could we could we print that double sided and distribute that? I mean, I know it's paper and ink and money. I understand that very much, but I thought the presentation itself was really valuable for people to have. Yeah. Or do we want to just do the one sheet or what do we want to do? So that's, that's what needs to be decided and it needs to be decided sooner than we knew. Um, I would say based on the email that we got today, would you say Mary Beth, it sounded pretty like much. I want it now. Yeah. Okay. Right. <laughs> He's back on vacation now. He wants to get back to work. So, um, okay. Our, yeah, so I think what I hear you asking, Michelle, is the rest of the board comfortable with us making that decision about what it will be given the time frame? Yeah. I mean, it's not going to be DV. We're not creating anything new. It's going to be pretty much what David's already created, what, Mer what Julie's already created. We're not starting a new message. I just want to make sure everybody's comfortable with the fact that you're not going to see it until next week. And by then it will already have been baked and sent out. So yeah, I mean, I'm perfectly comfortable for sending out what was done before. I would just encourage us to not winnow it if we can, because I think the public really wants to know. And I think having been at that Hamilton meeting it was so powerful to actually have it. I mean, people, I think people need the information. So and I would happily volunteer to, uh, you know, staple play arts and crafts to make that happen. If we right, right. <laughs> little packets, I'm happy to spend all night packeting because what? I'd rather have people have information than say, gosh, what was this? What was it? It was just, it was really helpful. And I think it helped explain what we're trying to do. Yeah. So I will happily volunteer to do that. We'll that print helps. them in black and white and you can color them all. Um, yeah. I'll do anything again. I will. I don't mind. Do you, um, do you want me to quickly make a motion to give sure. you three approval? So I make, sure. all right, I make a motion that the Hamilton Women's School Committee give permission to Michelle Bailey, David Polito, and uh, Superintendent Mary Beth Baños to act on our behalf to uh, create uh, uh, something. Uh, now hand we have to <laughs> town meeting. Blah. What? Nope. Don't. Okay. Don't use the word create. You're going to authorize Mary Beth to do it, and she will consult with whoever she feels like she needs to. Yeah. Uh, 
we scrap that because we don't okay. want to create a subcommittee because yeah. then we have to post meetings. Yeah, that's, that's okay. what I was. Um, Hamil I uh, make a motion of the Hamilton one and school committee authorize Mary Beth Banos to, um, uh, uh, <laughs> Mary Beth. Submit, could I submit documents. Submit, submit documents to whomever she wants to support the school district at the town meeting of Wenham. I'm done. Dana, you're all set. Second. Do we have a second for that? I'll second that, I think. I think we yeah, have Dana. Right. So, what, um, so, to be clear, the superintendent is authorized to do whatever she wants to get those documents ready. She can consult with whomever she wants and submit whatever she wants. And if we don't like it, then we can just let her know on her review later. So it'll be all good. So. <laughs> and Mary Beth, I will help you manufacture. I love an arts and crafts project. So. <laughs> I will hold you to that, Anna. <laughs> oh. All right, um, Dana. Yes. Michelle Bailey, yes. Uh, so Horrigan. Yes. David Polito. Yes. Anna Stasek. Yes. Peter Waldick. Yes. When Stacy comes next time, I'm gonna have to remember she comes between Michelle and David. Okay. All right. Or you just just go in an order. Just yeah. take the top left and just keep going. Yeah. Okay. Um, I make a motion that we yeah. adjourn. Uh, uh, wait. What? Oh. Wait. Sorry, Michelle. I, I just have one Agreed. one thing. Have we made a decision about whether the chat feature is part of our official minutes? And I thought maybe we sh there was mentioned by Stacy that maybe we should just shut it off. Yes. My my personal opinion is we should shut it off. That's my personal opinion. It is a public document. So anybody who's written anything in there, we have to keep that right. as a public document. I personally believe we should shut it off after public comment. But Do we have to vote on that or is that a policy making decision? That could be a policy. <laughs> My only, my only thought about that is, I mean, I kind of agree. I don't think it's the right forum for public debate or discussion amongst themselves. But I do think, you know, like tonight, for example, one of the audience members asked Dorothy to stop sharing her screen so that we could all see each other. So is there a way that we could enable it so that if people are having technical problems, they could still chat to one of us to say, I can't hear you. Yeah, doing but that. Could but the, the problem with that, the problem with that in reality is, we are having a meeting in public. This isn't a public meeting. So like, honestly, that request almost shouldn't have been, because it's more important for us to see that information and work in like, and we've been working with, <coughs> excuse me. Um, so, you know, while we do want to be cognizant of um, the people we have watching at home at the same time, like it's more important for us to make sure we're doing what we need to be doing. I, can I, I'm going to disagree a little bit, David, that, you know, like if you were in a public meeting, if you, we were at Buker and someone said, I can't hear you. Right. We would address that. Right. Yeah. Like it's a technical issue. If sharing it's just, no way, there's just no way to filter comments versus, you know, right. no, and I, and I understand, I'm just saying in terms of technical that you're right, that sharing the screen was a little bit different. <laughs> But in general, if someone isn't able to see or hear the meeting and in person, you would correct that if, if someone were saying, I can't. No, agreed, but yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's the I world. I don't have the solution, but I, I do think it is. Yeah, I mean, we, I did put that question out to MASC listserv and like a handful of school committees did get back and most of them said they do turn it off after public comment, but we... Because customarily, if it was a regular in-person meeting, you would have public comment, which would be open and recorded. And then after that, it's not necessarily intended to be a back and forth unless it was a public hearing, which these meetings are not. Right. I guess maybe the only caveat would be is if, you know, I don't want to be too draconian about establishing law and order based on what usually happens because I do think the beauty of zoom these days is that more and more people are able to watch and participate and feel like they're getting at it. So I guess if there was just some way that if someone was having a problem and I don't know who to direct this to, I, I mean, I hate to have Vinny do more work or someone, but if someone could be 
the recipient of that if someone was having a problem or couldn't do something. I don't know. I mean, I just, I don't, I don't want to discourage the public from participating in any way whatsoever. And if we have this platform that enables more people to participate by viewing and watching, I don't want to discourage them, but I agree, you know, the chat is not the place to debate policy and that's not really, and, and, and I will say now having been a participant, it's hard to pay attention to both. It's distracting actually to try to listen to the conversation and also be like, Oh, what's in the chat? Like you see it pop up. So I would be okay disabling it after public comments, but I want people to still be able to, um, get on or ask, I don't know. I, I, I see both sides. I just see both parts there. Well, I mean, don't forget we, we have this, forum right on zoom but it's also being broadcast um on our uh, community cable channels and are we live streaming on youtube at the same time right so we actually give multiple options for people <coughs> to be watching and you know as long as we're you know we have this hw cam down the corner and bill melville's not telling us hold up guys that's really the only one that's going to be telling us you know, that we're having technical problems. I think that I actually think that's the valid point right there. That if right if if we're just on TV and that was the way to see it, so I think that's that's fair. As long as as long as we enable the chat for the public comments, you know, I think that's. Um, I just don't want to take. I don't want to take away the public's opportunity to speak in the appropriate place in the appropriate way. Okay, so can we put this on a next week's agenda then? Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Between now and then, we should test this to see if they can still raise their hands. Because it may be possible that they could still raise their hand if for whatever reason we wanted. That's true. To yeah. them to yeah. express something. We just have to watch it. So um, okay. we'll set, I'll set up a test with, you know, we'll call a few people and we'll set up a test and see if it works. Okay. Okay. And, I, um, and one, last, one last thing before we go, David, thank you. You were in the trenches taking grenades for thousands of hours as chair of the last year. I learned a tremendous amount from you and we developed a strong working relationship that I greatly appreciated. So I want to say thank you to you. And I want to say thank you to Vinny. He's, you know, he's also in the trenches taking grenades, spending a lot of hours giving, carrying that continuity and institutional knowledge between administration. So you are key. Um, Superintendent, I want to thank you for calling ahead and um, addressing any questions we had before. So to help expedite the meeting and um, and Michelle on the policy group, I uh, you are, <laughs> I am humbled every time I work with you to, with your knowledge of policy and the regional agreement and your knowledge of the district institutional knowledge. So I am I, I thank you for a great year and I thank you for taking on the chair. You're welcome, Peter. And thank you for being the best cook. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a lie I can live with. Thanks. <laughs> All right. So um, same place. Michelle, give us a whatever motion to adjourn. Yeah, please make a motion to adjourn the meeting at 9.24 p.m. Second. I thought I'd get to second. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, go in order. Next week, we'll change it up. We'll go in reverse or something. We'll go by, you know, birthdays sometimes. Uh, Dana. Yes. David, who's on the screen first? Michelle Bailey, yes. Michelle Horrigan. Yes. Uh, David Polito, yes. Anna Cizek. Yes. Peter Walzik. And yes, and thank you to Dana and Anna for stepping up serving the community. Thank you. Thank you. Good luck. Okay. Have a Good night, night, everyone.